Good morning, everyone. Morning. 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 Rick doesn't need a microphone because he's got a loud, booming voice. That's right. I'm a little guy. I need assistance. <laughs> My name is Roy Jennings, and I'm the director of the automotive program here at Caldwell Community College and Technical Institute. And I appreciate y'all coming out today. Uh, we're looking forward to a, a fun day of training and uh, uh shop tour and an advisory board meeting and this thing's cutting out. I'm just going to pull a Rick White and I'm going to get loud and speak to you. How's that? That'll work. We'll get rid of that. Uh, really am looking forward to y'all being here. This event we put together just a little over a month ago, so I think we've done pretty good about getting things put together. Uh, bringing in uh, Brandon Dills, Jarhead Diagnostics, do some training, and uh, Rick White to do some training on management today. And a little over a month ago, I met with a few uh, gentlemen in Boone, and we sit around lunch table, and we had a discussion about 
changing the industry and industry working with education. And uh, Mike Allen, the president coming in for uh, ASTA was there. Chad Whitley uh, was there with us. Jim Kakonis, Eric Mortison, the instructor at Watauga High School, and my instructor, uh, Jacob Husky, and we can't forget Pretty Boy, Lucas Underwood was there. And he's been the in instigator that has helped me connect with these people in industry. And we talked about what we could do to bring industry in, uh, to get some big industry partners to help us promote the program and let them know what it is that we're doing here with our students. And we formulated this day, that day at lunch. Uh, and I'm very appreciative to what they're doing to help me with the program. Here at Caldwell, we've worked for years to help build the program up from what it was years ago to something that we can be proud of and be in a national spotlight and have reason to be there. We care deeply about our students. We're not going through the paces. I'm not here with a state job just working towards retirement. I care about each and every one of my people. And you can ask them. They're here mixed in the crowd and some more will be coming today. And about lunchtime, we'll do a student panel. It'll give you an opportunity to ask these students questions. Ask them questions about education. Ask them if they don't like me, and I want them to be honest, you know. Or if there's things, yeah, I'd, final grades are not in yet, kids. But uh, I want them to be honest with you, and I want you to ask them questions about their education and their future. And I want them to have an opportunity to ask you questions that will, about what to expect. When I step into a shop, what's day one going to be look like? What's five years down the road going to look like for me? You know, when I'm ready to retire and I'm an old man, like me, what's it going to look like? You know, what is my life in the automotive industry going to be? I've got 35 years experience in the automotive industry, and uh, I also teach the state inspection class. Last week, I had somebody ask me, said, if you had to do it all over again, would you? And my answer was yes, Absolutely. It's been an adventure, it's been a joy. Every car was an experience, good, bad, or indifferent. I've had good years, I've had bad years, but yes, I would do it all over again. There's nothing else I would want to do. And with my students, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking at AJ sitting there that is a Toyota Master Tech, and I know he's looking at me like he called me out. Yeah, uh, but AJ was in the program a decade ago. And uh, he's got a successful career at Toyota. He enjoys working on cars. Urban Justice, part-time instructor for me now. When I started here, he was a high school student taking my class. First semester I had him. And now he's owned a business for 10 years and has done very well for himself. So I'm proud of the effect that I've been able to have, that the people that I have worked with have been able to have on these individuals and we want to keep that going we want you to get to know these students hire them put them in places mentor them and help them grow along the way i thank you for coming i want to thank everybody that's helped participate asta for uh, providing us the food and the drink uh changing the industry podcast for blasting us nationwide and helping to sponsor this event we're live streaming so uh, people around the country and perhaps the world are hearing and watching us. Uh, I appreciate that very much. I am humbled to think I'd have that much support coming in to help this program in this little county here of Caldwell. Uh, I appreciate the support of the administration of the college. Dr. Porch, who is president of the year for North Carolina, North Carolina Community College president of the year this year, we're extremely proud of him and Dr. Chafin and Liz Buchanan and Keegan Anderson, my administrators that have backed me and helped support me for this event. I appreciate them. I appreciate industry. And most importantly, I appreciate my students, the place where I find my happy spot when I get to spend time with them out here showing them how to do stuff. Thank you. And I will turn it over to who's next. Brandon Dills, Jar Hit Diagnostics.
Get used to that. <clears throat> All right, everybody. My name is Brandon with Jarhead Diagnostics. A um, little bit of background about me. Uh, joined the Marine Corps. Was in the Marine Corps for eight years. Did aviation maintenance the entire eight years. And after I got out in 2012, I started automotive, and I've been in automotive ever since. And then around 2019, we started Jarhead Diagnostics. We manufacture diagnostic equipment for the everyday technician. Um, whenever that started taking off, I went full time with Jarhead, and then I did mobile diagnostics and programming for a little bit. And then uh, we shut down the mobile program about two years ago, and I opened up a shop. So now I'm a shop owner and still running Jarhead Diagnostics. Um, <clears throat> a little bit of background about me. So next thing is we're just going to start the class. Um, it's a little interactive, so if I ask questions, you know, just help out. <clears throat> All right, 2001 Chevy 4.3 crank no start. What would be your first steps in the diagnostic process if this just came into your shop? What would you? What would be your first steps? Verify concern. All right, next. What's the next steps? What would you do? Check source voltage. Okay. To what? To battery. Okay. I mean, you got to have 12 volts at the battery, and then you got to have 12 volts uh, voltage to the fuel. Okay. What would be some of your first steps? So checking the voltages would be good first steps. All right. So we're going to get to a case study towards the end, and we'll go over this exact vehicle. <clears throat> a 2013 Toyota RAV4, 2.5 liter stalling when turning to the right. What would be your first steps in this? <laughs> Go left. <laughs> First step really should be just be a verified concern. Does it actually stall when turned to the right? This one actually was stalling every single time you turn to the right. Um, same thing, we're going to kind of go over this case study towards the end. But this is just to kind of get your guys' mind going. These are actual cars, and you got to kind of figure out what your process would be because these are real cars that came into our shop, and we had to start our process somewhere. <clears throat> All right, why is a process, uh, why is it important to have a process? Having a process in place will assist in more accurately finding the root cause of, for the concern, allow for a quicker path of performing your diagnostic work, help build confidence in your ability, keep you on track. Less likely for those rabbit hole situations. All right, so for me personally, the biggest one out of this that you need to take away is um, building your confidence because Whenever you're doing diagnostics, a lot of people, they don't have confidence on, is that computer bad? Is this component bad? If you don't have that confidence, then whenever you go to tell the service advisor, hey, this part's bad, if you kind of sound like, eh, I don't really know if it's bad or not, they're not going to have confidence in you. So having this process is going to build your confidence. But then once you have your confidence, then you're going to be more accurate in your findings, and you're going to be able to go, you know, get there sooner. And then the biggest one is the rabbit hole situation. We've all been there. We're like, it has to be this component. This component has to be our fail, when really the fail is over here and you're looking at something you don't even need to do. I've done that multiple times. Spent hours and hours and hours trying to figure out something that is perfectly fine and really the situation is elsewhere. Like checking timing on a Ford or a, a Jeep 4.0. Yeah. <laughs> All right. The process is, is pretty, it's five easy steps to follow. Step one, you need to get a proper debrief from your client about the concern. Step two, before any testing code scans or even going to the vehicle, post what parts you need to replace on a Facebook group and then leave that post there and then you know from there you need to go. And while you're waiting for the response, that's when you perform a code scan. Then you get back on Facebook, you argue with everybody saying that they're wrong. 
and then you just replace the part that the code's good. Everybody good with it? <laughs> All right, <clears throat> the actual one, uh, debrief from a client about the concern. That's the biggest one that a lot of people miss out. <clears throat> My check engine light's on. Okay, well, was your check engine light on because you're going uphill and it started shaking, check engine light flashing, was just your check engine light on? The debrief could go for anything besides just a check engine light, anything at all. You need to make sure you're getting a proper de debrief. You need to verify the concern. <clears throat> Do a full health report. That's a big one. Most people just try and scan whatever module's the issue. If, if you're scanning modules, scan everything at that first go because you could have something in a different module that's going to point you in the right direction. Research, testing, documentation, verify the repair. All right. Steps two, three, and four, on average, they can be swapped around. The biggest reason is, let's just say, for instance, it's in the afternoon and their concern is it's gotta be cold to, to report or to, to repeat it. Might as well go ahead and do a little bit of research of what that concern might be and go ahead and do your health report and while you're waiting on the next morning, just that way the car's not sitting there longer than it needs to be. So you can kind of flop those around, but really you need to stay in order if you can. Step one. Thorough debrief, a thorough and proper debrief uh, from the client about the concern. When discussing the issue with the client, always remember that you're the professional. You are, like you are the professional and they're coming for you for professional help. They came to your, you or your shop uh, wanting to help solve a problem. So with being the professional, you need to know that you get the required information out of the client. Sometimes a client knows there is an issue, but they may not have the forethought to articulate how or when the concern happens. As a professional, you need to assist the client with putting the puzzle together, the who, what, when, where's, and why's. Ask leading questions. <clears throat> Let's say the concern is the vehicle's surging while driving. If you happen and ask an open-ended question, when does this happen, the client might just say all the time because they don't, they don't think, well, it's only happening uphill or it's only happening downhill. It's only happening whenever I'm turning. Ask leading questions. Does it happen when it's cold? Does it happen when you're driving uphill? Slow speeds, high speeds. Can you duplicate the concern at any time? Whenever you ask the proper questions, you can get more out of it. Don't ask the open-ended questions and just expect the client to know what's going on. <clears throat> leading questions can be bad whenever you're just trying to get an answer that you think is the, the cause, but Whenever you're doing it, depending on what you're asking, sometimes you have to ask those leading questions to get them down that right path. But I thought leading questions were bad. <clears throat> Why you should ask leading questions. When you ask leading questions, subconsciously, you're guiding the client to reveal more information than they think they know. They will also allow you to quickly push the conversation in the correct direction. That's the biggest one, and if for anybody that's been a service advisor, You'll start asking them questions. The next thing you know, they're going to tell you about how their mom died 10 years ago while the dog was next to them, and it has nothing to do with it. So whenever you're asking your questions, it keeps them on that track. <clears throat> what do you do after you ask the, uh, the client questions? Listen with your ears and your brain and not your mouth. That's the biggest one. I was once told sometimes it's okay just to shut the heck up. Um, if you're listening to respond, then you're not truly listening. So when you ask that question, you just be quiet and you let the, the client answer. So that way you're, you're listening. When you're listening, try to think what could cause the issue so that way you can attempt to duplicate the concern. This comes into play when the customer is trying to explain when the situation happens. They may tell you it only happens when I'm leaving my house to go meet my girlfriend Sally at her house. This presents you with the ability to ask a leading question. So tell me, what are the roads like when you go to Sally's? Do you usually go in the mornings, right after you get home from work? And just those two follow-up questions, you can see if the client's driving uphill. Are the roads bumpy? Is it highways, back roads? Is it in the morning on a cold vehicle? Is it in the afternoon on a hot vehicle that's been setting for a little bit? Asking these questions is going to be able to pull as much information because you have to duplicate the concern, so you need to know when you're going to duplicate the concern. One final uh, takeaway with the clients. <clears throat> As we stated in the beginning of the section, you are the professional, so make sure you're acting the part. Clean yourself up before talking to clients. Don't be covered in grease, Doritos in your beard, and stinking of sweaty booty funk. <clears throat> when you're talking with a client, it's yes ma'am, sir, no ma'am, sir. No profanity. 
I use profanity like it's my second language. So it's, it's difficult for me, but I've learned whenever I'm talking with a client, just kill that profanity. You're, you're professional. You don't want to sound like you're ignorant whenever you're talking to somebody. Present yourself as a professional. First impressions go a long way. You could be the best technician to ever work on their vehicle, but if they don't trust you or they get that bad vibe, no matter what you do, you're going to be in the wrong. Because most of the time, they think of us like this, just a grease monkey that works on cars, whenever really the technology is so advanced nowadays that that's far from it. Step two, verify the concern. The biggest mistake or issues people run into when doing the, any type of diagnostics or testing is not being able to duplicate the concern. If you can't duplicate the concern, how are you supposed to properly diagnose the concern? You must remember, diagnostics is not just about check engine lights and drivability. It can also be squeaks, rattles, incompetent ignition switch actuators. If you can't reproduce the concern, you won't truly really know what's, uh, what your diagnostic approach is. What's an incompetent ignition switch actuator? That would be the driver. Most of the time, you can have a concern, like in all my time at the dealership, I'd say 75% of our concerns could have been corrected if they would just read their owner's manual. Like this, the vehicle is just op, a, acting properly. So that's the biggest thing is sometimes you have to let the client know. It's like, hey, your vehicle is doing as it's described. Intermittent concerns. Intermittent concerns are the worst when it comes to duplicating the concern. <clears throat> it is strongly recommended that the, the client bring the vehicle back when it's failing. Um, that's, that's the biggest thing. <clears throat> because if they feel like they need to leave it, then you need to make sure the correct time sold because on some intermittent concerns, you could be spending hours and hours and hours just trying to duplicate the concern. And you know, as, as a shop owner, I kind of run into the feeling where it's like, okay, I try and go over and above with the client, but sometimes if you're spending a couple hours to duplicate it, you need to make sure that that time is sold before you mess with it. Intermittent concerns can easily take your lunch money if you let it. So make sure they're set aside time to duplicate the concern. Also make sure the client's is aware prior, if you can't duplicate it, then you can't do any testing. That's that's the biggest thing, is they feel like, oh, you just plug the computer in and it's gonna tell you exactly what to do. I hear that all the time. That's not the case. If you can't duplicate it, don't do any testing. If there's, well, my check engine light was on and then you get it, check engine light's off, and there's no codes, what are, you, what are you gonna test? There's nothing for you to test. So make sure that you can duplicate it before you start moving forward with any testing. All right, <clears throat> this right here is the Toyota RAV4 we were talking about earlier. Debrief from the client. Client states over the past two weeks, the vehicle stalls or attempts to stall while turning right in a forward motion, meaning not from a stop sign, but you're actually in forward motion, like turning into a parking lot or into a side street. The concern happens at all times, whether the vehicle's hot or cold, road conditions do not play a role in this at all. <clears throat> Speed does not play a role, minus, like I stated before, you just have to be in that forward motion. You could be doing three or four miles an hour, you could be doing 40. Duplicate the concern. <clears throat> when I first sat in the driver's seat and started the vehicle, I heard a slight timing chain rattle. The check engine light was off, but maintenance light, light required was on. I looked at oil change sticker, showed oil change was past due at 135,000, with the current mileage at 15504. So it's 20,500 miles past due for service. The moment you start your process and you walk out of that vehicle, you are automatically in diagnostic mode or testing mode. That's from the time you get the vehicle. So pay attention to everything. I looked at it, it's past due for maintenance. While driving, I made several right-hand turns and the vehicle acted like it wanted to stall and sometimes would stall. I recorded the dash during this event. Turn right. Anybody see it? Nope. Oil light flicks on. So every time I would turn right, the oil light would flick on. <clears throat> Vehicle had no codes in any modules. Research. Uh, the one, this one didn't really require much, require much research, but I decided to do a quick check just in case there was something off the wall common with these vehicles. No, no known common concerns with the issues with a game plan of checking the oil level condition being the main focus. 
and then check for drawings of where oil pickup might be located. And if you load it, notice, so this right here is the driver's side of the vehicle as the pass, or vice versa. That's, this is your um, passenger at your driver's side. So if you notice the oil pickup is on the opposite side of the vehicle from whenever you're turning. So as it was turning, it was sloshing oil away from the pickup. <clears throat> the only test inspection needed to start was check the oil level. Then verify there was no major leaks present. There was no visible oil leak on the dipstick or no oil and no visible leaks. Documentation. During our documentation, we stated we found oil levels low and the light would turn on while turning right. Then we explain they needed an oil change. And then we kind of go into a write-up. The oil is present, there's no oil present on the dipstick. Also during uh, sharp right-hand turns, the light would come on, cause an installing issue. Um, changing the, and then I kind of go into why you gotta change the engine oil. And then we charge them for oil change and they approved it. So verify concern after perform oil change. We test drove the vehicle, making frequent right-hand right -hand turns. There's no lights present and the vehicle didn't stall. So one thing that I always try and hit on, another big thing, is getting paid for your knowledge. Like, you're not, you're, not, you're not getting paid for, I'm just doing an oil change. It takes you knowledge to look down and be like, you know, the oil light's coming on. I know that if it's got lack of oil, it could cause a stalling concern. So not only for this did the customer pay for the synthetic oil change, they also paid for my level one testing at 150 bucks. I mean, it sucks for the customer that they had to pay $230 for oil change, but they're paying for your knowledge. They didn't come for you to say, I want an oil change. They came for you for a stalling concern. And you had to go through the proper steps to make sure that that was your only concern. Step three, complete vehicle health report. Some people may say uh, to only scan the module with the issue, but we recommend starting with a full system scan. First, the main reason is sometimes you can have co codes in multiple systems that can help you in your diagnostic process. Not only this, but it also a majority of Cover your own ass. <clears throat> you can use this as a backing for possible comebacks due to concerns you were not diagnosing. This is an actual vehicle that came through our shop. It was a 2014 Jag XJ. And as you can see, it had a couple of codes in the system. So this vehicle originally came in um, for just a coolant system leak inspection. Why would I do a, a full system scan on a coolant system leak inspection? What'd you do to my car? What else? There we go. See if there was a code in there for a cylinder head over temp or just an oil temp over or a oil temperature over temp. Just any of those because what does that lead you to? If there was any of those codes then we know the vehicle overheated. Now we know that there's a high probability of engine damage because they overheated the engine to the point that it threw a code. It's kind of a cover, like I said, a CYA. <clears throat> Uh, this is a good example. The client could have came back with an ever since you fixed my leak, my XYZ is having issues, but with us pulling the report, we can step back and explain that was there before. Because they could have came back and said something was going on with HVAC and we pulled the codes and those codes are present prior, so we have all that documentation. For this vehicle as a reference, why would you want to do a full system scan with a uh, coolant leak? We kind of already went over that. Imagine doing this inspection. Getting the repairs quoted and approved, you, uh, you perform all repairs, including any upsells, because we're in this business to make money, so you do your inspection to check over the whole vehicle, and let's just say, for instance, they're like, oh, it's just a radiator hose, I feel comfortable putting $1,500 in brakes, $1,000 in tires, oh, my spark plugs are due, and next thing you know, it's a $4,000 bill, and it comes back for engine overheat, so now you're kind of look looking like the, the a-hole there because you didn't do your proper inspection. So now you're kind of left on the hook. That's why you always do the steps. It doesn't matter which testing you're doing, follow this same process. The process is good for everything. So follow your process because the biggest thing in today's society is making sure you're covering your own butt. Research. Research is one of the most overlooked tasks when doing diagnostics. I see it all the time. When I, was mobile, uh, when I was a mobile diet tech, or even when I worked in shops, so many times technicians would go down a rabbit hole because he or she missed that one step. <clears throat> Why should you start research before testing? 
In automotive testing, it is not like when great-grandpappy used to lick his fingers and grab a spark plug wire. Vehicles are more advanced than ever, almost to the point where you hired a heard exhibit say, you know, you wanted a computer for your computer for your computer. CAN networks, pull up, pull down, uh, circuits, temperature variating, changing sensor readings. If you don't research, you don't know what you're stepping into. In this step, you learn if there's TSBs for the exact concern. Because I can tell you from my experience, nothing will make you more mad than spending hours diagnosing concern only to find out there's an ECU update to fix that concern. Now, let's ruffle some feathers, and this is mainly for most of the techs out there. I personally start with Identifix. I don't go towards the top hit, but I start with Identifix with 90% of them. Why do I start with Identifix? Usually just to piss off the keyboard warriors on Facebook. <clears throat> Some people feel Identifix is a crutch because most people use this as, as like, they just go to the top hit. But that's not us. So use Identifix with a smile on your face. Typically on Identifix, when you search a code or concern, right at the top of the page, there's service information, any TSBs that may pertain to that concern. And lastly, it tells you how many other people have had that concern. If there's been a thousand other people that's had that concern, then you, you know that you might be having a little bit more information to go off of, but if you pull it up and there's no information, then you're kind of, you're, you're starting from scratch. Let's see why I started at Identifix. Um, we have a vehicle recently in our shop, the concern was check engine light was on, the vehicle was in lint mode and the transmission would not shift gears. It was a 2011 Buick Enclave. <coughs> We had, uh, we were able to communicate with everything, but if you notice, the TCM is not up here. It was in lint mode, couldn't shift gears. So on here for engine U0101, even though that is just a very basic code, I just went and identified and searched it. There are some top hits. I usually start right here because I like it where it pulls up the TSBs for you. You automatically know, okay, yes, there's TSBs, and then you can kind of get into the service information from right there. You click the tabs and it pulls you all the way up and you can view all of your TSBs. After a quick scan, none of those TSBs really pertain to this vehicle. So then usually from there, I'll just go to the top hits. Not because I'm wanting to say I want to fix what that is, but a lot of times on Identifix, whenever you go in, if it is a common concern, they will already have a lot of test plans that's built for you. In the automotive industry, especially flat rate people, time is of the essence. And then not even that, even if you're hourly, the more you can produce, the better for the shop. So if there's already built test plans, then you don't have to spend 20 or 30 minutes trying to build a test plan whenever there's already been a bunch of concerns and that test plan will be able to show you what you need to do. All right, for this one, it was the codes. And then this isn't the best and it just kind of tells you a quick test plan for this one, it really wasn't the best for us. But for our top hit right here, it says that the transmission control wiring, and then it even talks about corroded, losing uh, due to the plastic cover connector. So for us, you can see right here, wire's broke, the top of the connector is broken off or is, is removed, if you were to lay that back over, you can see right where it was touching that top of the connector. Now, before we got to that, I didn't just go straight to that connector because that was a lot of work to get to the connector. We checked all of our powers and grounds to the TCM to kind of figure out. We checked, we made sure that, that there was proper power getting to the TCM, and that's whenever we found that that wire was messed up. If we wouldn't have went to the top hit, how many of you would have started checking your power somewhere up there away from the connector, pulled the loom back and started back there. A lot of people would have. Some people would have pulled the connector and went straight there. But if you're like, okay, I have no power here. It has to be in the harness. I'm going to go back in the harness to try and find it. But if you, you know, it's right here at the top. That top hit kind of led us a line like, okay, this is common uh, hot spot. Might just check it while we're there if we don't have power on that wire. Now you can see in a short amount of time, you've received a bunch of information, potential test plans, and potential common failures. If you notice, not once did I say go to the top hit, replace that part, or do what they, they did. You're just pulling information, uh, as much information as you can. This way, when you start your testing, you have a game plan. 
All that and Mitchell both offer something similar to Identifix, but for me, just the layout isn't quite as quick. Um, like for our systems, we use Identifix and All Data, but whenever you search All Data, it kind of comes in a list, and then you have to kind of filter through that yourself. I just like Identifix because it's all up top. Um, Mitchell's pretty good, but half the time it doesn't pull to any TSBs. You have to kind of search for TSBs in a separate screen. So that's why for us, we start with Identifix. When doing your research, don't forget to look into wiring schematics. This will help your mind to start understanding how that system is laid out. Plus, it will help you with, uh, with starting your test plan. Most schematics will give you a brief description of po uh, component location. This will also help during your testing to find where the component is located at in the service information. That's, that's, I mean, every single testing, unless it's a squeak or a rattle, I'm always in the, the wiring schematic looking at how that system is, is set up. Because if you don't know how it's laid out, you don't know where it's getting your powers from, you don't know where it's getting grounds from, you don't know what's commanding it, how are you supposed to test it? You can read the description all you want, but for me, I'm a visual guy. I can read and read and read all I want. I'm dumb as a rock. I won't understand it. But whenever I can see this and it's laid out for me, it just makes it easier for my mind. All right, for research. 2016 Kia Optima check engine lights on and flashing. Uh, client stated while driving down the interstate, the vehicle lost power, check engine lights on and flashing. They restarted the car, the light was still flashing, would not go over 40 miles per hour. Health report. That's our health report. The only code in there is for a knock sensor. Where would you guys go in this situation? Check TSP is good. What's a knock sensor for? Like, what does a knock sensor read? Detonation. Detonation, right? Okay. So knock sensors, for anybody that didn't know, is to help out with timing for potential leans. So if it's, if it's getting a spark knock, it's going to adjust your timing. Knock sensors will not pick up a rod knock. It's a totally different uh, frequency. The PCM does not care if it's rod knock. Kia had so many issues with rod knock that they updated their PCM to listen to rod knock through the knock sensor. And it throws a knock sensor code. Now, how many of you would have started instantly looking at the knock sensor whenever you pulled your code? You didn't do any research, you just pulled the code, knock sensor. Okay, I need to start checking my knock sensor. You would have been up shit's creek without a paddle because it has nothing to do with this vehicle. <clears throat> we did a quick, uh, quick check on Identifix, um, looking for any TSBs. There's no TSPs uh, present. Now, this is one, I'm going to show you a mistake in Identifix, but it will kind of help you out. There's no TSPs up here that you can click on. If we go to our first top hit, it has the TSP in it. So that's why it's also good to kind of go in there and look at them because it will pull up those TSPs. And then it pulls up the TSP on what you're supposed to check whenever that code's present with those conditions. Research. What was the purpose? We kind of already went over what the knock sensor's for. Kia updated the ECU firmware to detect rod knock as well as spark knock. Test plan. Verify if the engine's actually knocking. If it's not, inspect the harness to the knock sensor. Verify torque on the sensor mounting. So as you can see there at idle, if we would have just kicked it on at idle and we're just setting it in there, we would have never heard it knocking, so we just went on the next one. Always do your research, always duplicate the concern. Documentation. This is kind of where we go over documentation's key. This is the biggest takeaway, and like there's a lot of big takeaways, but documentation, CYA. If your shop is still using paper and pencil, you need to update. Go to some type of service or um, software management system where you can have DVIs and you can actually go in there and put in information. So that way you can put in, this one was 15,000 miles past through for oil change. I wonder why it's knocking. Um, we have the video of it knocking and then we even put the TSB in there and how they want us to check it. All that's just CYA because this one is actually sitting in my parking lot right now because Kia was going to decline the engine and they didn't have 10 grand to put an engine in it. So it's all CYA in case it gets to the point where the customer says you're wrong 
you have documentation to prove otherwise. Step five, testing. <clears throat> now that we got a research done and a rough idea of systems we're testing, what do you do next? You start with the funnel approach and testing. What's the funnel approach? Does anybody know what the funnel approach and testing is? All right, you always wanna start big and then work your way down. You do not start with pinpoint testing. There you go. So let's just say for instance, we've got a misfire. You can do one test that could quickly tell you which way you need to go in your misfire process. Do a quick relative compression, clear flood turnover, listen with your ear. If it sounds like it's got low compression, then about an 80% chance to 90% chance you're gonna be working with engine mechanical. If it sounds good, then you're working with something electrical, ignition, injectors, whatever. But you're starting with that funnel approach. You're not just saying, cylinder three, I need to check the spark plug, the ignition coil, I need to check X, Y, Z, put a compression hose on it. Don't do all that. Start with the big test first. Yep, this sounds like mechanical. Now let's do mechanical testing. Oh, this does not sound like mechanical. Let's do other testing on that cylinder. <clears throat> the funnel approach means you start with a large quick test, multiple items at once. Just watch out when doing the funnel approach because sometimes it can cause you to lead, lead astray from the root cause. This is just a made up vehicle, but uh, 2014 Chevy 1500 cylinder four misfire. Where would you start? Okay, where would you start? <laughs> All right. For my first step, I would use my most expensive uh, tool in my arsenal, my ears, and I would just do a clear flood. I would start with a clear flood during engine turnover. During this test, you can listen to the cadence of the engine. I typically let it spin over for about 10 seconds before you really start listening mainly because once that engine first turns over for those first 10 seconds, it's not gonna be a stable engine turnover. So just let it hit about that 10 second, five, 10 second mark. Then you know that engine's in a stable spin with the starter. That would be my first step in the funnel approach. If the cadence, of the, uh, if the cadence is rhythmic, then most likely it will not be due to engine mechanical. If the cadence does not sound even, you have a good chance of dealing with engine mechanical problems. Why do I say most likely? Okay. Um, what's that? There you go. So we're talking about a 5-3. What happens whenever the valves don't open? You still have compression. So your cadence is still going to be rhythmic, but you have no valves opening. The valves could have been open, allowed the air in, and then once they close, now you've still got the air in there and it's still pumping against itself. You still have a rhythmic pattern. <clears throat> Why do I say your good chance of dealing with engine mechanical if it's not even? Cylinder wash. Cylinder wash. What's cylinder wash? There you go. All right. I say most likely because DOD engines, when, when the uh, failed lifters will sometimes still have a smooth cadence, this is due to the valves closed, so the compression is still present. This is just one example, but it's showing that you're doing the funnel approach, but don't, don't in the back of your mind, just say nothing else is possible because there's still always that chance. I say a good chance with this because something non-mechanical, he mentioned cylinder wash, a hung open fuel injector are known to cause cylinder wash, which would cause a low to no compression. Once again, just one example. A lot of vehicles nowadays uh, where they've got variable valve timing, variable valve lift, variable compression lift, all of that, you can have an electrical component that makes it feel like there's no compression because it didn't lift the, the lift it up properly. <clears throat> After you start with the funnel approach and have rolled out majority of systems, only then should you start pinpoint testing. You should try and steer clear of starting with pinpoint testing. If you start with uh, pinpoint testing, you have a much higher risk of going down a rabbit hole because you're solely focused on that one item that you're testing. And in your mind, you've already started that pinpoint. It has to be this. And then you'll start going down a rabbit hole for something that you don't need to do. When you start pinpoint testing, make sure you have a game plan. Have the game plan prior to the pinpoint, pinpoint testing or any testing for that matter. 
and it will less likely to bounce around. You'll follow the test plan and keep on target. When performing any type of testing, always keep an open mind. But just because you've never seen a certain type of failure doesn't mean it can, can't happen. Don't overlook small things because you don't think it matters. The main failure could actually be a symptom of a root cause. A failed ignition coil. What can cause a failed ignition coil? Spark plug gap. Spark plug gap. Lean conditions. You could have an intake leak that creates that much of a lean condition that your ignition coil failed. So don't overlook just because that ignition coil failed. Always double check everything after you repair the component because that could just be the root, like a symptom of a root cause. Follow your instincts. Your instincts can lead you astray, but usually you can count on your instincts. But don't forget to test to verify. When you find a failed portion of the test, retest at least once. Don't just say that test failed, it's, this is our part. <clears throat> there have been numerous times I thought I had a failed item when really there was an issue with my testing. Double check your test. That little bit can save you a lot of time. Because I don't know about you, half the time I don't have time to do what I'm doing now. I really don't have time to do it two or three times whenever I uh, misdiagnosed it. Always, test your uh, always check your test equipment prior to use. Why should you do that? Because if your test equipment's bad, you are gonna get a bad reading. Nothing worse than you think you have a failed component or a working component that's actually broken, but then you think, uh, but you think differently because of faulty equipment. These two wires are touched together. What should this be reading right now when you're checking your leads? Should be reading zero or 0 0.1 something. My leads were open. If I would have been testing for circuit integrity and continuity, I'd be like, oh man, I got a failed harness. Let's go into the next set of testing when really it's just my test equipment. Always double check prior to work. If it's broke, it's broke. It won't be accurate and it'll only cause you a lot of sleepless nights. That much I can tell you. <clears throat> you find a bad component. What is next? Remember from earlier, the concern you're having could be the symptom of a root cause. Using a failed ignition coil as example, which I kind of already went over earlier. Worn spark plugs, excessive lean condition, a failed harness, a failed PCM. Failed harness is a big one. I had an ignition coil. It was on a Chrysler 2.4. I do not remember what vehicle it was. I just remember the four-cylinder. The ignition coil was literally exploded out the top of it whenever I did it. My dumbass, I just put a new coil in it, started the vehicle, the coil exploded within a minute. The coil driver was shorted to ground, so it had full power all the time, shorted to ground so that ignition coil stayed on constantly. So always double check and make sure that there is nothing else that caused that component to fail. <clears throat> and another reason why, or check circuit integrity to the fail component, that's a big one. We'll go back to ignition coils, what is a high probability on a Ford whenever ignition coil fails? PCM, take out the PCM. If you don't do that step and you just put a coil on it, now you're making a second call to the customer. Hey customer, I know you just spent $600 to put this ignition coil on that was under the intake. Oh, by the way, you also have a $800 bill because you got to put a PCM in this vehicle. It don't look good to you. It don't look good to the shop. Don't forget the basics. I know a lot of us feel like we're up here and we always forget to check the basics. Always, always, always check the basics. Step six, documentation. Now that all the testing is complete, you've found the, the cause for the concern, it's time to document everything you've done from pictures, test plans, felt components, your findings, TSBs, document everything. When do you start your documentation process? Walking out to the vehicle. You're automatically starting that documentation then. Put it in your hip pocket till you're done. If you take a photo, don't delete it till you've already put it into your documentation. If you've got a test plan that you've wrote on a scrap sheet of paper, take a photo of your test plan and add it to the repair order. So that way they know this is what all he checked, this is where it failed. All the way back to step one. You should keep documentation during the entire process. Doing your research, make sure you keep all that information handy. During your testing, take photos along the way. Take notes of everything you did during your steps. 
Think of documentation step as a puzzle. Steps one through five were all the pieces of the puzzle being made. Now that you have all the pieces made, you're using the documentation to put that puzzle together. You're creating a clear, precise picture to both the service advisor and the client. One of the worst things you can do as a technician is spend hours of testing and at the very end, the only thing you have to show is it needs a flux capacitor. With no context, proof, nothing. They're just having to trust that it needs a flux capacitor or a swivel joint for the wobble shaft. The clients, that's all they hear. They don't know, but if you have that documentation, they can say, okay, this technician did spend the time, he did do all these testing and it did fail. And the reason I say that is because you could do all the testing and you did all the testing right, but you still misdiagnosed the issue. At least if you have all that documentation and your shop owner or service manager or whatever is upset, the customer's upset, you at least have that step back like, look, I did all these testing, this is what I found, and this is why I thought the component was messed up. Whether or not you have to eat crow or not is still on the table, but at least you can have proof, this is why I did what I did. <clears throat> this is how I require documentation in my shop. Document if, the, if they verify the concern or not, document vehicle health report, uh, document all the test procedures, and then I, I like to get a photo of the bell component unless it's internal of a transmission or internal of an engine and it takes hours to get to it, I'm not gonna have them take a picture of that. But if we can get to the felt component, I like it. And then like here is off of our shopware, it's our testing for our, our inspection process for it. We verified the engine was running rough and had a loss of power. We did a health report and we added it. And then here for this one, during our inspection, we found fuel trims were incorrect at idle and, but would read properly off idle. This led to us inspecting the mass airflow sensor. During the inspection, we found the mass airflow sensor was contaminated and appears the incorrect air filter was installed on the vehicle. The incorrect air filter most likely caused the contamination of the mass airflow. If all you did was pop the mass airflow out, you would have missed that this is the wrong air filter, which I can't really see it. There you go. This vehicle has two air filters you can choose from, a smaller one and a large one. The last person did an air filter, they put the wrong size in. So now this was just sucking raw air in that's non-filtered and it contaminated the mass, excuse me, contaminated, contaminated the mass airflow. <clears throat> then point of failure, we say contaminated mass airflow and an air filter, and then we just put our warranty and they approved it. When writing on your uh, writing out your documentation, use proper terminology, but if need be, follow that up with everyday man-woman explanations. Be precise in your documentation, but whenever a customer reads it, they need to be understand what they're reading. Don't say I own from this to this, this pen to that pen, they're not gonna know. Put all that documentation in, but they may be on the last sentence. From your engine computer to your engine, you have a faulty wire harness. So that way all your documentation's there, but they know, okay, he was testing my wire and harness. Be truthful with your write-ups. If you can't win them over with brilliance, don't baffle them with your BS. <laughs> Step seven, verify repair. This is the second most overlooked step in the process, verification of repair. Always remember this step because if it can put you in a bad, space, bad place quick if you don't do this step. Trust me, I know it all too well. Either you're pressed for time, the shop owner, manager, rider wants the car back so they can bill it out but the same, but that same list of people will make you the fall guy if the vehicle comes back with the same issue. <clears throat> or you think to yourself, self, you're Billy the Badass and your findings are rock solid. You don't need to double check yourself. But I can tell you from hard lessons learned, that is not the case. What are some of the reasons you should always verify repairs? What does new stand for? Never, ever worked. Never, ever worked. You could have put, you could have done everything correctly, diagnosed the correct part was faulty, and put it in, and that part is bad. You don't verify the concern. Again, after you put that new part in, it makes you look like the a-hole because the part that you put in is wrong, and they still feel like you did it wrong, like you did the testing wrong. Always check. Just because the part's new does not mean the part will be in working order. Back in my dealership days, I could tell when a car was manufactured on a Tuesday morning and a car that was manufactured on a Friday afternoon. The quality of vehicle was off between them. 
parts of the exact same quality of standards was greatly decreased over the years. <clears throat> so don't let the rely on, this is a new part, it's good. Human error. No one is perfect. You can unintentionally or unknowingly damage something, installed something wrong, or simply miss a step during the repair. <clears throat> you could have shifted a harness that, that in doing so uncovered a potential root cause. Or simply, you did a very common thing and you misdiagnosed the concern. It happens all the time. All three of these things are very common. They are much easier to do, or much easier to correct prior to the client picking the vehicle up versus the, it coming back. You made a human error of misdiagnosis, you messed up the install or whatever. It's a whole lot easier to call that client and say, client, it's gonna be an additional two days for the repair. We ran into an issue during the repair, yada, yada, yada. Then the customer spends $2,000 and they come back and throw a phone book at you because their car is still messed up. It's a whole lot easier to fix it prior. <clears throat> Depending on how your shop is set up, I understand that uh, this may be difficult, especially if you're uh, a diagnostician and you're only doing the pe uh, testing and then passing off the repairs to someone else. But you need to sit down with management and work out a way to do some sort of quality control inspection. Quality control inspections are huge. How to verify repair. Uh, Reperform the pinpoint testing that failed the previous attempt to reduplicate the concern. If it was a check engine light, test drive the vehicle until the monitor, until that monitor for the system uh, has set. If the system that's capable of scan tool, scan tool uh, perform it. Think of it like a um, an EVAP system. You fix EVAP, most scan tools and most vehicles let you run a full EVAP test and it'll actually set the EVAP monitor in your bay. You'll know, okay, I did a correct repair. <clears throat> the process may seem like a lot, but most likely will slow you down at first, but once you mold the process into your own, it will greatly speed you up and give you the needed confidence and raise and, and raise your fix right the first time. Remember, you're the professional, build a professional job. Act the part, be the part. More time, let's go. All right, here are a couple of additions, uh, additional things to go along with the process. These will make your uh, life easier and more profitable. Get paid for what you do. Always be ready for the next job. Getting paid for what you do. After you debrief with the client, discuss with the service advisor, owner, manager, whoever's in that process at your shop, what will be required for the testing, approximate time needed for the testing, and if you start the testing and realize you need some in-depth pinpoint testing, compression testing, component removal testing, et cetera, stop and discuss. Don't just take it upon yourself to do the excess work without compensation. That's the biggest thing, and a whole lot of shops are, I'm only charging the customer an hour, I don't care how long it takes. That's wrong. You're in a business to make money. They're paying for your knowledge. Don't pull the intake because you just want to do a quick compression test. No. If it takes two hours to pull the intake, the customer has to pay those two hours. You didn't buy it, break it, or anything. You didn't design it. You're just there to repair it. <clears throat> After you're done with repairs, discuss with the advisor manager what type of repair verification, quality assurance inspections are needed. Like if it needs a text, uh, test drive of the vehicle, XY conditions for catalyst monitor sets. Sometimes it could take 30 to 40 minutes to an hour of driving for the catalyst to set. Are you supposed to be doing that for free? No. So in some way, whenever you're building your estimate, that extra time needs to be added in there. So that way the shop's being compensated properly and you are as a technician. Make sure time is sold prior to perform the testing and or repairs. If there's a mistake, bring it up. Be the professional, don't be the punching bag. Always be ready for the next job. Keep your work area clean and organized. Keeping a clean and presentable work area not only shows you take pride in your profession, but subconsciously you make it makes you want to uh, produce more because working in a greasy, nasty, dirty shop makes it feel like you'll never get it better, which changes your thought process to why should I even care? If you work in a dirty, nasty shop, most of the time you're just going to feel like I don't care. It's nasty anyways. Keep yourself organized. It will greatly increase your productivity. You won't be spending 30 minutes looking for that 10 millimeter socket that you left in the intake of the car you were working on yesterday. If everything has a spot, that's, then you know exactly where your tools are. If you had to choose, would you choose the messy or the organized? 
And just to be honest with you, all of these are my own, like for my own work spot. So I get disorganized just like everybody else. But if all my tools are put back, it just makes life easier. I know that some days it's just been that day and you're just ready to leave and you just throw all your crap on top of your roll cart and leave. But in the next morning when you get back to work, spend that 10 to 15 minutes and just put your stuff up. <clears throat> Could you stay motivated and be proud of your career if you worked in a shop like either one of these? No. You'd come to work, hate life. It's like, God dang, it sucks working here. It's so cluttered. I can't stand it. It's nasty. It's dirty. I mean, I was going to say, you know, you could be like Lucas and he worked out of the back of the house for a while. But every time you went there, for the most part, their bays were clean. You go in there, every tool had its spot and stuff was put away. Just because it's not the best working area, you can still put stuff up and clean up. Or could you see yourself and being proud working in one of these? For me, I'd much rather come here and work. I'd be happy to work there. I know that if I'm wearing shorts, because I like wearing shorts, and I kneel down to set the lift, I don't walk, stand up, and I got black all over my knees. <clears throat> I know not every shop has a, a Zamboni tile pool, floors, epoxy floors, <clears throat> but if you just spend 10 minutes a day just cleaning up your area, at the end of the week, even if you started out in a nasty shop, you're going to have a clean one, and it's going to make yourself feel a lot better, and it's going to go a long way. They do. Thank you, Eric. <clears throat> Try to keep your diagnostic equipment at the ready. Set up your diagnostic car or a portion of your toolbox as a diag station. If your diagnostic equipment is in the bottom drawer of your toolbox, under the tool, tool truck flyers and six inches, of, six inches of dust, do you think you're ever going to use it? No. It's going to take me way too long to try and get this test equipment out. I'm going to try and find a shortcut. That probably won't give you the correct answer. Keep your scan tools charged and up to date. If you keep your equipment out, easily accessible and easy to use, subconsciously, you will use them more. But if you keep them put up, you'll find another way, typically less accurate, way to perform a test, just because you didn't want to pull out and set up test equipment. Oh, is that the one you're donating to the school? Is it, that's, that, I think that's an Eric's Bay now. <clears throat> At our shop, we outfitted a Harbor Freight roll cart as our diagnostic station. We have all of our first grab equipment in there, a computer with the decent sized monitor for doing research and reading wiring schematics. One of our shop scan tools is on it, always being charged, and we keep an oscilloscope connected and ready to go. I set it up so my guys have no excuse when they're performing testing to do proper testing. If you, if you have a shop that is big enough, try and set you up some sort of diagnostic station so that way if a car comes in, you can just roll that up to the car and get to work. It's a Harbor Freight cart. They're cheap. There should be no excuse if you've got room to go get one. Snap on one. Well, <laughs> Eric's got a snap on one. Wink. It was a Harbor Freight. I just threw a snap on sticker on it. All right. <clears throat> so back to the beginning. 2001 Chevy S10, 4.3 crank, no start. Debrief from client. This was from whenever I was mobile as a diag tech. Vehicle is towed in for, uh, due to an engine knock. Shop replaced the long block. After engine replacement, the vehicle could not start. They replaced fuel injectors, which had the spider injector under the intake. Ignition coil, crank sensor, verified distributor timing. Vehicle has fuel pressure. Due to the age and type of network, you could only perform, you couldn't really do a, a full system scan. We did a scan of all modules individually. No codes were present. I did a quick search. Um, to see if there was anything can point me in a direction, no. Like there were, there was really nothing to kind of point you in a direction for this concern. So using our logical thinking, we assume this must be most likely a man-made issue since the vehicle ran before but didn't after the engine install. With that game plan, we're checking spark, injector pulse, or plus, whatever, injector pulse, and a crank signal is as the initial game plan. We went to our wiring schematic to look up the pinpoint for testing. <clears throat> After looking, I deemed the easiest one to start with on this engine was at the crank sensor. During my research, I noticed the crank signal first uh, for a couple reasons, easy accessible, and if there's no crank sensor, um, if the crank sensor was not installed properly or bad, it would cause no spark, no injector pulse. So I decided to go with there. The crank sensor's hall effect, and I just kind of go into the, that. So here's a known good. Um, 
if you guys are on Facebook, try and go uh, get on like the Automotive Waveform Exchange. There's an ATS, Known Good. Try and get all on all of those so that way you have Known Goods for oscilloscope, oscilloscope captures. Keep, huh? Diag.net. Um, so, uh, some manufacturers are getting better of adding scope captures in there, but they're still not there, especially on older vehicles. So make sure you have some place where you can reference it. If you have a Pico, make sure you're going into the Pico library. The only way to do that is you have to have your Pico plugged up. It reads the serial number. It lets you log in. <clears throat> this one was courtesy of Eric Enright from the Waveform Exchange. My first thought was, why does this look like a relative compression on a crank sensor? Kind of looks like, who, who all's done a relative compression with a scope? Looks like a relative compression, right? This should be a crank signal of some sort. Testing, pulled it out. What's missing? The inductor, missing. That should be right there. If it doesn't see the signals, is it gonna start? Nope. So in case anybody's wondering if they want to do a relative compression, pull the engine down, take the exciter ring off, put everything back together and do a relative compression. As you can see, during the reassembly of the engine, the crank tone wheel was left off, which meant the PCM could not identify timing, thus creating a no start condition. System scan. Oh, whoop, my bad. 2017 Ford Edge, check engine light. Debrief from client, check engine lights on, vehicle runs rough. During first startup, no other drive uh, drivability concerns. This was in my shop. This is my diagnostic process. Did a system scan, cylinder one misfire, uh, misfire detected. The all wheel drive thing was just a spoof code. Psh, who needs to do research? It's a cold start misfire. I went straight to, it's a GDI engine. Check the plugs, check the valves. That's common for GDI engines. They get a lot of carbon buildup, cold start misfire. So we sold them pulling the intake, doing a decarb service and putting new plugs in it. It's gonna fix it, it's common. Psh, who needs to verify repair? I did everything correctly. During our process, I missed a very first major step, research. Had I did this step, I would have found a TSB specifically explaining the exact concern. I don't know if you can read it. 2000 goes into the vehicles. May exhibit a low coolant level, white exhaust smoke or run rough condition without an illumination of the mill light or a P0301. That's a video of coolant running into the combustion chamber. <laughs> Who needs to do research, right? Our shop just ate a $800 repair bill. Who needs to do research? I think everybody needs to. Because if I would have done that one step, the customer would have known that they needed to do an engine versus spending 800 bucks that now I have to refund to them. Research. Vehicles are not like they used to be. Research, research, research. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Thank you, sir. Man, I really want to say thank you for all of you to being here. Uh, this organization and what we do here is really building the next generation of Americans. We're not talking about the next generation of automotive students. We're not talking about the next generation of automotive managers or shop owners or whatever it may be. We are building the next generation of Americans. We're giving them the tools they need to go out into life. Last night at, at the meeting we had last night, I heard the most impactful thing I've ever heard. A parent came to me and said, my child talks about how impactful this class is for them. And I said, why is that? And they said, because she said it's teaching her how to adult. How impactful is that? How important is that? Folks, we're going to take a quick little break. We've got something real special coming up next, but I want to remind you of a couple things. We're giving away two Scanner Danner books. Who in the room knows about Scanner Danner? 
Probably some of the best automotive training out there. We're going to give two of these away to the students in the room. They had to pick up a ticket. We're also giving away two yearly subscriptions to Scanner Danner Premium. So that's a big deal. Also, I had the honor, Roy gave it to me, of announcing to all the students in the room, if you showed up today, you get extra credit for showing up. You need to go talk to Roy. So big hand for Roy on that one. All right, we're going to take about a five-minute break. Uh, so let's be back in here by about 1040 and we'll start back, all right?
have to yell. Why are you yelling at people, Rick? Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, how many, I've got a question, how many, uh, how many technicians do we have in the room? Raise your hand. <laughs> there you go. All right, how many service advisors? Yeah. All right, how many students in the room? That's exactly right. How many shop owners in the room? How many of you shop owners started a shop and said, uh-oh, this is not what I thought it was? Yeah, exactly. We kind of walked into it, didn't we? I was the same way. I walked into shop ownership and had no clue what I was doing and, and almost ran myself in the ground and, and didn't have anybody following me. And, and if, if you've heard the podcast at all, you know I always talk about leadership. And talk about this guy named Tim Kite. One of the things he teaches is if you want to lead people, you have to be going somewhere. And, and if you're going somewhere, you have to take people with you if you're going to be a leader. You have to be going on a journey. You have to be taking them somewhere. And so the next speaker is somebody who helped me develop where it is that I was going. And his name's Rick White. We'll have him come up in a minute. He's going to speak to you for a few minutes. But one of the things we want him to speak to you about is a lot of the students in the room have said, I want to own a shop. But they don't understand that owning a shop is not working on cars. Owning a shop is not writing service. Owning a shop is much bigger than that. So we're going to ask Rick to come up and speak to you guys. Give him a big round of applause. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Wow, we got a good crowd here today. That is awesome. So I really appreciate you all being here. I, can I move this? This is just like... You know, I was pretty, I was pretty happy. Brandon was asking questions and I could still answer them. Right. I thought that was pretty cool. Right. Hey, how about if I just talk from back here? Does this work for everybody? Right. My mom said I had a face for radio. So, so I'm just going to say, we're going to have some fun. Is that okay? All right. Who said, sir? No, sir here. Oh man. That's my father. I right, sir. Mr. White. That's what that stuff. Right. No. So listen, I want to start a talk. Where are my, where are my students here today? Fantastic. Listen, I am so excited for you. And here's why, because you are entering the auto repair industry at probably one of the best and most profitable times there have ever been. And I'm excited for you, but I want to challenge you too. Okay. I want you to understand that when you leave this school, this is not the end. It is just the beginning, right? You're gonna have a great foundation to learn from. For you to be where you think you wanna go, it's gonna probably take you another three to five years. Okay, how many would agree with me, shop owners? Give me an amen on that, right? This is a great beginning. So please always be learning. I'm gonna tell you the day you stop learning, that's the day you start dying, okay? So I want you to understand that, okay? Now, here's the other thing. I don't want you to be the best. You know why? Because you're allowing other people to set the standard. Students, I want you to be your best every single day, okay? Now, how many students here want to open a shop someday? Man, I love that. I, can't, that, hand, that, I thought that was spring-loaded the way that hand went up. That's awesome, dude. I think that's great, but I want to I want to I want to work you through some stuff, okay? How many technicians we got in here again? Just show hands real quick. All right. So listen, I want to talk to my students again. Just I'm, I'm still with the students. I'm going to go students, techs, and owners. How's that sound? All right. So, and this is by far the shortest presentation I've ever made as far as a PowerPoint presentation. So I'm pretty I'm pretty excited about that. So y'all gonna go out and get a job, yeah? Right? Well, here's the problem. You know what job stands for? Just over broke. Okay? I don't want you to go for a job. I want you to go for a career. I want you to go for a calling. I want you to create something that really means something. I still love that feeling when you walk into the bay at 8 o'clock in the morning. And hopefully that's not late for y'all. Right? But I walk in at 8 o'clock in the morning. I got my cup of tea. Anybody knows me, I am a voracious tea drinker. 
So I have my cup of tea in the morning. I got a car that three other shops have had. And I'm like, all right, let's rock. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about with that feeling? It is such a cool feeling. But I need you to understand something, the students. You guys are going to go for work. And I'm going to ask you something. Don't figure out what you want to make from money right off the bat. What I want you to understand from your, your, your prospective employer is what do they expect? Make sure that it's a fair trade. Make sure that it's a reasonable expectation and get it so it's something you can measure. Does that make sense to y'all? I don't have, listen, I'm gonna tell you straight up and I'm gonna make some owners mad right here. I think every technician that's a good technician should be making $100,000, $150,000 a year today. All right, can I get an amen from my techs and my students on that one, right? Y'all work hard, don't you? Now, I need y'all to understand something. I grew up in this industry. Some of you don't know me from Adam. I grew up in my dad's shop. I was playing with carburetors when I was six years old. And for those of you that are too young, carburetor was a fuel delivery system component before injectors, okay? I was rebuilding transmissions by the time I was 17 years old. I've owned shops. I've managed fleet garages. I've worked in dealerships. I actually tried bodywork. Well, that's not true. I sanded a fender for 15 minutes and went, nope, that sucks. <laughs> and I drove around for a year and a half with a rusty fender, right? I was worried about that rust, you know, my first car not being the chick magnet that I was hoping it for it to be. And, and my dad gave me my first car, my mom and dad. It was a 1965 Ford Country Squire station wagon. Let me tell you something, that was just... Yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about the opposite of a chick magnet, that like that car was right there. Was that? Oh man, I'll tell you what though, I had an aftermarket AC system. You could chill meat in that sucker. Um, and I know I didn't get any girls in there, but boy, could I pack it with friends. We had a blast. So I want you just to understand kind of where I'm coming from. Does that make sense? And I've had the blessing. I sold my shop and went to work for a shop management system. And then in 2003, had a client, a user, having financial problems. And I said, hey, you know, I'm pretty good at numbers. Let's see if I can help you out. And less than 18 months, we doubled his business. He went from $100,000 a month to two, over $200,000 a month in sales. And it was like a light shone down from heaven and said, hey, stupid, this is what you're supposed to be doing. So since 2003, I've been out helping shop owners kind of get out of the shop and back into their lives. Does that make sense? So I, I have a unique perspective here. Some of it's age wisdom, and some of it is coming from a closet full of t-shirts that say, been there, done that, right? You want to talk about going bankrupt? Done it. You want to talk about trouble with IRS? Done it. You want to talk, oh, don't ever borrow from the IRS. They suck. I'm just telling you now, borrow from anybody else but them. Those bastards will take everything, including your underwear. Um, I've, I've owed the state money. I've, I've gone through everything. I've gone through divorce. I've gone, I've moved businesses. I've sold businesses. Everything you can think of, I've done. Okay. So I love helping other people. And I want to tell you something real quick. I, I think probably one of the most underappreciated positions in our industry are our teachers. They have to get by a lot of times with so little support financially and from the industry. I really believe that the teachers that we're kind of hanging around with this week, would the teachers please stand up just for a sec? These are the unsung heroes in our industry. Would you agree? Look, can we give them a round of hand, please? Yeah. And I'm gonna challenge you students when you get out of here, don't make it the last time you're here, come back and help them with the advisory board. We need everybody's perspective to make this work, okay? You are the next generation and I'm excited to see what's coming and you guys, you have no idea what's in for you. I'm telling you the next 30 years in our industry is gonna be absolute gold. You're gonna have trouble not making money in this industry, okay? So I want you to be your best. I want you to challenge yourself every single day to be better than you were yesterday, students. How many of you are willing to do that? Because I guarantee you,
That's going to make all the difference in the world in your career. Okay? Now, I'm going to tell you something real quick, students. When you go out to get a job, be sure that the expectations are clear both ways. Like, you know what you're going to get paid. Make sure that you know what they expect. Right? Because that's going to make for a better relationship. Okay? But here's what I'm going to tell you now. There are some ugly shop owners out there, and I'm not talking about not pretty. All right, how many technicians here have worked for a shop that they wish they never saw? Okay. There are some ugly shop owners out there, but I got a Rickism. I, I got my, my clients know my Rickisms. Here's one of my Rickisms. You're going to kiss a lot of frogs before you find a prince. Please don't let one bad shop taint you on the industry because that's what I'm seeing today. I see guys and gals, please, I'm from the Northeast, so when you hear me say guys, that's non-gender specific. But I'm telling you straight up, right? I'm seeing students that leave a school and they're going to work at a dealership or something and they get stuck in the quick loop bay for three years and they don't see any potential, so they don't quit the dealer, they quit the industry. Don't do that. Recognize you've got a crappy employer. Braxton, I didn't swear. Okay, that's hard for me. But I'm telling you, like, Brandon, I, I got you, brother, right? It, it, it's hard. So I'm going to be kind of the good Christian, but Peter is kind of my, the foul mouth disciple. He's kind of my hero, right? So what I want you to understand is you're going to meet some bad bosses. You're going to meet some dishonest bosses. You're going to meet some bosses that don't know what they're doing. In fact, I'm going to tell you the same thing. I used to work for a complete jerk managing the shop. And I decided that's it. I'm gonna go do, I'm gonna go out on my own. I'm not doing this anymore. And I quit him and I went to work for a complete lunatic. Me. Right? I had no idea what I was doing. Because I made the mistake of thinking that being great at fixing cars meant I was gonna do great in business. Now, how many shop owners here can give me an amen on that one and say, boy, that ain't true? That ain't true, boy. I can fix a car, right? You, so you start out on your own. Here's what's going to look like. You start out on your own. You're going to be working by yourself. We call you the chief everything officer, CEO, right? Those Staples commercials on steroids. You got Dave, IT Dave. You got, you know, you got customer support Dave. Yeah, you're going to be everything. You're going to work 18 hours a day and bill three hours. How many owners? Owners, tell me if I'm, am I is this honest or what? Okay. But you got to understand you're on a path and here's where the path starts. You start with a dream. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to dream big. Take over the world. Okay. Because what was it? I read a quote this morning, it was awesome. Y your destiny is what you decide it will be. Ralph Waldo Emerson. You decide on where you're going. See, in most of us, and I'm saying us because I got what? I got a butt whip whipping a bunch of times before I figured this out. Most of us don't realize we are on a journey when we start a business, right? So it looks like this, right? You start out with the dream, man. And it's big and it's great. It's going to be absolutely amazing. And I'm going to have all this free time. I had a guy tell me he started a shop so he could have free time. I said, that's like half saying, I'm going to have a kid. How many of y'all have kids? That's like saying, I'm going to have a kid so I can have more free time. It just don't happen that way. Right? So you have the dream and it's awesome. It's exciting. And it's, it, 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 it just lights you up. And when you first start the shop, man, I want to just talk to my shop owners for one sec. I want you all to think back to that very first day. You took the key and you slid it in the door to unlock your shop for the very first time. How many of you were ready to take the world? How many of you were ready to say, I got this. I'm going to do this. It's going to be amazing. How many of you were scared? Because that comes with it, right? 
So here's the thing. You start that shop up. It's a lot of fun. It's invigorating your own boss and everything like that. And then all of a sudden you realize, crap, I got bills to pay. Right? And it sucks when you got more month than money. Right? How many of my shop owners know what I'm talking about right there? Yeah? Right? You got more month than money. And you're like, oh, boy, this is not as fun as I thought it was going to be. And then I got to do financial stuff too, man. I just want to fix the cars. And I'm telling you right now, there's more good technicians that start out as shop owners that are going out of business because they shouldn't. And it's because they're looking at the wrong thing. Okay. They're looking at the wrong thing. So we start off and we're all excited. And then eventually we become the slave. That's that 18 hour day and you're billed three hours. See, if you're married, and for some of us that is more than once, right? I'm not proud, but you know, there's a couple of marriages that bit the dust. Um, you first start out, your spouse, they're your biggest cheerleader. They're so excited for you, they wanna be a part of it. And then over a period of time, what happens is they start to see the shop as the other woman. Now you're shaking your head here. You've been there. What's your name? Gordon. Gordon. Hey, I appreciate that. Well, speak up. How did that? Tell me about it. Well, I'm kind of an enrolled technician right now, but I did start my own in uh, 2005. I had a partner that I started with. Um, like I said, wife was uh, very excited. Started with no money kind of deal. And uh, quit my job on Halloween 2005, and uh, there's a little shop in Statesville, and uh, we're in there for a morning doing our thing, and thought I knew it all. I taught kids and done different things. I think it might have been great. I didn't know anything about what I was doing. And the partner who supposedly had her own businesses knew even less. Um, within about eight months, I looked him in the face and said, by the end of the week, one of us is leaving. Decide who it's going to be, but I built a marketing company. And um, I got rid of him. And I didn't have a paycheck for almost a year. And my wife got it. And that definitely brought the other woman from the employees didn't pay, never even did sit there. Um, I jumped into a management program and learned some things. So I turned the corner there, but by that point, you know, you talk about the more month and money thing, that's when the bottom fell out. Second Great Depression, if you will. And I had kind of a psycho landlord who was on a handshake deal. He looked at me a week before Christmas and said, You got to be out by the first of the year. No reason given. So I moved back to my shop at home and uh, worked that way for a while. And the wife and me got to go back to work for Jeff. So here we are. So, yeah, it's um, not an easy task. And you know, sitting here, even as a technician, it's still, um, it's still running through your brain. Maybe you have to step off. And, and I'm going to, and Gordon, I'm going to tell you straight up. First time I did it was a crash and burn. I did it when I was 20 years old. I opened my first shop and lasted five years. I sold it basically just for what I owed on it. It was like $30,000 back in the day. For most of y'all weren't even here when I, this all happened, right? I'm older than dirt, right? Like I went to, I went to dinner with Moses. You know what I'm saying? So, I ended up going bankrupt out of that because he ended up folding and then all the vendors came after me and I ended up going bankrupt. And that's not the end. It's just a lesson, right? That's what we got to learn. You know, Henry Ford said it best. He said, failure is the opportunity to begin again more intelligently, right? It's just a lesson. Okay. So, you know, one of the things I always loved, I, I heard this once and they, and they said, you know, scars, scars hurt, don't they? But you know, the tissue and the skin, there's not a stronger spot on your body than where there's a scar. And I think that's just part of life, isn't it? We're gonna get knocked down, we gotta get back up. That's part of it. But I want you to understand that you're gonna go to work for shop owners that don't know what they're doing. You're, they're gonna be deceitful sometimes, not always. A lot of times I believe shop owners want to do what they say, they just don't know how to but it comes across as deceitful. 
And here's what I want you to understand. If you get, for my students, if you don't get anything else out of this, you should value what you bring to the table. But here's what I need you to understand. A shop owner will not value what you bring to the table if they don't value what they bring to the table. Does that, does that make sense? You've got to find somebody that's going to be out there. And there's a lot of amazing shop owners out in this industry that are begging to find help. And if you're going to be the best and you're going to work for the best, that's amazing. Okay. But please understand just because someone doesn't see the value in you, it doesn't mean you're not valuable. It just means you're in the wrong place. Okay. So go out there, get the job, but understand it's learning. In order to learn, you got to be quiet. You got to listen, ask for advice. Don't think you know it all, right? I've been, I've been literally in this industry. I don't even want to think of how long, 44 years. I love this industry. I have met some of the best people in this industry. You will never find a tighter bunch when you get them together. You're in a great, great occupation field. And the sky's the limit. You know, maybe you tech for a while and decide, you know something, I wanna be an advisor. Guess what advisors should be making? 100, 150,000 a year, okay? And here's the cool thing about it. Back when I started, right? I told my dad I wanted time and a half on Saturdays. He said, great, you can work 12 hours. <laughs> Yeah. Dad, I want to raise. He put a, told me to stand on the floor, Jack. Okay. It's different today. We have broken the, the, the triple digit labor rates. Most of us. Okay. I have shops that are charging over $200 an hour in our, in our groups. Okay. We're finally getting the fact that we've got to charge appropriately generationally, we have been subsidizing auto repair for our clients. And it's because we didn't know how to run a business. And it's because we didn't value what we did. Right? There are people out there that think what you guys do every single day is magic. Let that in. Right? Appreciate the fact of all the great stuff you do. See, there's this thing called cursor knowledge. And the curse of knowledge bites your butt two different ways. Number one, for my advisors and owners, when you, when you come to a certain understanding of a subject, a certain level of understanding, you unconsciously expect everybody around you to have that same level. And probably the best and funniest part that I can think to illustrate that is my brother went into the army and he came home and he, and he didn't talk in complete sentences anymore. He just talked with letters. I'm going to go to the PX. The heck is a PX, right? And we and I had to keep going. Well, what's that? What's that? What's that? But because he understood what it was, he thought everybody should know. So that's the first problem with the curse of knowledge. We got to make sure we we understand who we're talking to, okay? But here's the second thing with the curse of knowledge, because it takes about ten thousand hours to become an expert at something. Once we clearly understand, and it's easy for us to do, we don't value it. You need to value what you bring to the table. I was doing an invoice audit with a, a, an advisor in Missouri, and she had a diagnostic charge for 15 minutes. And I said to her, I said, 15 minutes? And she said, yeah, that's all it took him. And respectfully, I said, no, ma'am. I said, it took him 30 years to do it in 15 minutes. Stop selling the time and start selling the years, right? We should be selling the experience, not the time. Can I get an amen from everybody on that one, right? And, and Brandon, I was proud, proud as punch. I teach how to sell diagnostics testing profitably. Brandon, we should do like a one, two thing. You, you tell the technical side and I'll sell the, 
the profitable side, huh? I did it with your group there, right? Benji, it was pretty awesome. And one of the things I talk about is the fact that today we have to charge for research because back in the day when there was like two oxygen sensors, right? One was a, uh, you know, voltage generator and the other one was a, a resistance, right? On some of the European and Asian, it was pretty easy to go into a car and just say, okay, I know how the system works and we can just go into it. Can we all agree that it's not like that anymore? And it, and it could be the same make model year to year. So please don't devalue that, that research component of it because you can't know it all. And please understand from an employer perspective, we are not paying you to know it all. We're paying you to be resourceful. We're paying you so that we know you, you know where to find the resources so that you can do your job, right? That doesn't mean coming to me every 10 minutes and asking me what I think. Dude, I already paid. I'm paying you to do this, not me. That makes sense? Like, hey, you want an attaboy? I'll give you an attaboy, but stop bothering me. Get the stuff done. Let's go. So I want you to understand that shop owners have still got to step up their game. Okay? But stick with a good one. Challenge them. So what should a shop look like for a student? A, a shop should look like this. They should care. Does that work? Do you want someone that cares about you? I do. They should challenge you, right? I don't wanna hire you for who you are today. I wanna hire you for who I believe you're gonna to be tomorrow. Constant and never ending improvement. That should be a core value of the shop you work at. And here's the other thing you want, you wanna be valued. You want your opinion asked. Doesn't always mean they're gonna go with it, but you wanna be heard. You wanna have a say in things. How many of you agree with that technicians, right? How many people want stuff dictated to you? Wouldn't it be nicer if you could just step back and say, hey, here's our business issue. Here's what's gonna happen if it stays this way. And let's all sit down and figure out a way to make it better. Doesn't that work nicer? Isn't it easier to get behind something when you have a part in creating it? And I'm talking to the technicians, but I hope the shop owners are listening, right? Shop owners, you're not supposed to have all the answers. In fact, your goal, right? Can I write on this thing? Where's Roy? Can you help me out with that? Yep. You all right if I draw? I draw like crap, but let, let me draw a little bit. Can I draw a little bit? We'll have some fun. I'm done sitting. I can't sit that long. Oh my God. You just tell me what I can grab this. Plug this HP on my back. I gotta stay behind the screen like this. It's better for all of us. I believe that. You want just a whiteboard or yeah, just a whiteboard. whiteboard? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Someone asked if I would do karaoke. I think Roy was asking if I'd do karaoke here today. And I said I would, but I sing with my eyes shut because I hate to see people in pain. Right? Are we ready? Yeah, you can just pick any color. Any color. I just want to draw. Or you can just, you got eight pages, you just take your pencil. Oh, I got eight pages. Oh yeah. my God, this is awesome. All right. So here's what I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you what usually happens when you get a shop, right? We start by ourselves. Here's, God oh, damn it. There we go. Sorry, Braxton. Okay. Here's that seven second thing going right there, right? Oh, yeah. All right. So, so here's the CEO right there, right? That's the chief everything officer. I'm cleaning toilets, I'm doing the bookkeeping, I'm, oh, I'm fixing cars, I'm making marks, right? That's a sensitive little puppy right there. Hair on your arm, you can set it off. Well, I have hair on my arm. <laughs> <laughs> my 
Now, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. <laughs> Bring it on, right? So what do we do? We're going like this. How many started out like this? Yeah, right? So what do we do? I'm going to incorporate this. Watch this. Oh, look at that. Not even there anymore. So what do we do? Typically, what we do is we hire whatever we're most frustrated with. Okay? So for a lot of us, sometimes it's the bookkeeper. Okay? Then what do we do? We say, hey, I'm making a little bit more money. Let me hire a tech. Then let me hire an advisor. Then let me hire another tech here. And then I'm going to hire another tech. I'm going to hire a porter. Does that look familiar? So see what happens here, I can change the color. Everything is feeding this. Nobody makes a decision without our CEO being a part of it. And can we all see this is where the nightmare starts. This is where the slave starts. Because how much free time does the owner have here? Zero. And what happens if the owner, because what I've effectively done, can we agree, is that we call this the wheel. What happens if I take the spoke out of the middle? Wheel falls apart. How many owners know what I'm talking about? Right? Why do we do this? Owners, tell me, why do we do this? We enjoy pain. We want to be in control. Thank you. We are control enthusiasts. I don't want to say control freak because that's politically incorrect. Okay? So now we got the CEO. And this doesn't work, does it? This creates what I call daddy syndrome. This is where nobody makes a decision. So Gordon's working on a car. Gordon comes to me and says, hey, man, I got a problem. In this model, you know what I do? I say, Gordon, here, get out of the way. Let me show you how it's done. Guess what I just did? Now, I think as a CEO, right, as the owner, I'm helping Gordon. I'm helping him understand the right way to do it or a better way to do it. Agreed? But what did I really just do to Gordon? I just kneecapped him. My action said, I don't believe you can do this. Daddy syndrome kills everything in the shop. It kills curiosity. It, it kills growth. Okay? Now, students, we don't expect you to be perfect. We expect you to be honest. We expect you to own your stuff. We're going to break things sometimes. Just let us know. Shop owners, when they break stuff, if you go up and down and dress them down and everything else, guess what's going to happen the next time? They'll have three gallons of blue glue underneath that engine trying to keep that thing off. I heard if I got an inch and a half of blue glue, it'll hold 15 pounds of pressure. Okay? They're going to do everything they can not to tell you because you didn't make it safe. Now, what do you think their chances are they're going to want to continue to learn and grow? Zero, right? Because why don't they want to learn and grow? Because making mistakes is part of that process. I want them to make mistakes. I don't want them to keep making the same mistake. Because then it's not a mistake, it's a choice. I'm going to talk to somebody about choices. Does that make sense? But we got to give them room to grow. We always want them learning. That's part of the process. So the worst thing we can do is be the smartest person in the shop. Owners, listen to me please on that. You want to hire people or develop people 
to the point where they are better at their job than you were ever. How many of y'all getting like stuff tightening up on your body as I'm saying this? <laughs> right? But the reality is an owner is a different position. And no, I don't mean bent over. <laughs> okay? That's not what this is about. <laughs> it's about understanding. Wait a second. Where's that damn eraser? Okay. Oh, wait. I, never mind. I can go on another page. Okay. We got to understand that there's a process here. We have the owner. We have some advisors. We have some techs. We have a bookkeeper. And then we have clients. Yes? Now, the old style would show what? The owner up here, yes? And then it would show this is the military kind of authority kind of leadership, and it doesn't work. This is servant leadership. This is where the owner is there to help and support the team in serving the clients, right? And please understand, when it comes to clients, the first level is a guest. The first time somebody comes into your shop, they are not a customer. They are guests. What they're doing is they've heard about you. They think, oh, I, I, maybe I'll get this or this or that. So they're coming in and it's like, they're, how many of y'all go to a restaurant one time? And you're like, oh my gosh, that was good. I'm going to go back. Or you're going to say, oh no, that was really bad. I'm never going there again. They're a guest. They're trying you on for size. Then if they come back, they become a customer. And then they're going to become a repeat customer. And then hopefully we get them to a client. That's the goal. And then from client, raving fan. Now, guess what fuels that? Trust. Back to Brandon. Documentation builds trust. Right? Clarity, communication builds trust. So we've got to understand that we're all here to help and serve our clients, yes? And the money that we get for doing that, that is a byproduct of the value that we deliver. Right, Bob Bergen, and he's got a great book called The Go-Giver. He says that, that, um, that money is the thunder to value's lightning. It's a byproduct. See, owners, if you're chasing money, how many of y'all have had a, you know, like a puppy at some point in your life and the puppy gets outside, right? And the puppy's sitting there and wagging a tail and you're like, come on, come on, come on. What does the puppy do? I'm sorry. Run, Run right? And it'll get just out of the way. And then what does it do? Turns looking at you, wags his tail, says, come on, bring it, bring it again. <laughs> That's what's money going to do to you. That's what success does to you. You will chase it your entire life and never get what you need. You got to recognize that every single opportunity you're ever going to have is someone else's problem. How many of you are brought up with stranger danger? Right? Like some of you look at me and going, yep, yeah, you're a poster child for it. <laughs> right? <laughs> I get it. But here's the thing. We got to understand that beliefs work for a season. They don't have to be a lifetime thing, and they shouldn't be. Because how many of you get up in the morning, do your thing, cup of coffee or whatever, drive to work, work, have lunch. At, usually you have lunch at the shop, work, drive home, have dinner, watch TV, maybe chase your wife around a little bit, go to bed, and then start over the next day. How many do that? But here's the problem. We got to recognize 
we got to get ourselves in front of people we don't know. Because the people you already know that are customers are already coming to you. You want to grow your business, you got to get out in front of other people. You got to do stuff like this. Some of you have never seen me before. Some of you, I, I mean, I'm blessed. Like, I, how many of you went last night? That was awesome, right? The high school? I mean, I knew so many people there. It was so cool. But then I got to meet some I never, I, I haven't met before. It's awesome. For me, a stranger is just a friend I don't know yet. If you're in business today, that's what you're, that's what you got to be thinking. You got to be putting yourself into positions where you're getting to meet new people. You know, it was funny. I'm, at some point, Benji, you can, you, I think, attest to this. Yeah, you were walking away. See, I, I was walking away. No, you're not. So I, I was an assistant scoutmaster for 11 years, 12 years. And when my grandson, some of you, if you were at ASTE, met my grandson, Brandon, I was his cub master for six years. And one time I was sitting, I was, uh, we were doing closing ceremony at Scouts, Boy Scouts. I had my shop and I was just, we had about 50 boys in the troop. And I'm watching and I'm, I'm looking at the people and I'm like, yep, he's a customer, she's a customer, he's a customer, she's a customer, he's a customer, she's a customer. I never joined Boy Scouts to get customers. I joined Boy Scouts because it kept me in, out of jail as a kid. Oh, I was just a troublemaker. But. <laughs> right? So that's the thing. Get yourself out in front of things. Go to Rotary, Chamber of Commerce, uh, do videos. You know, you got to be able to do videos today. You've got to be able to get out there and make sure people know who you are. Yeah, but Rick, it's scary. Can I just all be honest with you? Every, each and every one of us, I'm going to tell you, the only thing that's keeping you from your dreams is three things. It's the stories you're telling yourself. It's the fears that you're believing. And it's the conditioning that you have up to this point, the habits that you've built. You can achieve anything you want. You've just got to be big enough and bold enough to go for it. Does that make sense? So we start out as that CEO in the block. And we listen to Gordon. And Gordon, thank you for your honesty. But he went a year without getting paid as an owner. How many owners are on performance-based pay here? Y'all are. Let me I'll tell you why. Who's the first one that doesn't get a paycheck if there's not enough money in the bank? That'd be the owner, right? And here's the problem. Most of us are technicians and we say, I can do this better. Or, you know, for me, it was people getting taken advantage of, right? I, I, I went to some shops. I worked at one transmission shop for six months and the day he, at, so I'm going to date myself, right? We had two cars that had C6 transmissions in them. The old guys are laughing. But one car was shifting hard. The other one was shifting soft. The owner brought them down, had the r, &R guys clean them off on the jacks and paint them, flipped them around, and put them up like this. And he wanted me to sign off that I built them. I quit that day. Okay, so you're going to figure out why you're starting your business and it's going to drive you with that dream. But then eventually you get this. And this is where it becomes the slave. This is where it's a nightmare. You're working long hours. You're frustrated because you can't get anything done because you can't get left alone and you're not going anywhere. And oh, by the way, you're not making much money either. I talked to a shop owner recently that was talking about joining. He's paying himself $300 a week right now. You want to figure out what that is a year? It ain't a lot. Who would do that? So what happens is we start going across that path. And what we do is we're not creating a business we're creating a sickly paycheck. 
I watched my dad for years work harder, stay up nights worrying, and he was making less money than the rest of his shop. We used to joke about my mom. My mom was so tight with money, we used to say she could squeeze a buffalo nickel until it cracked, and then she'd sell the crap. Right? She was just amazing with what she could get with, away with. This is not a healthy business diagram. This will run you into the ground. This will lead to divorce. Ask me how I know. This hurts. But when you can start to build a business and realize, holy crap, I'm going to help these guys. They're going to become the best ever. Owners, how many of you have trouble with techs going to training or, or your staff going to training? It's because you didn't talk to them about it in the beginning. You didn't make it a prerequisite of being hired. When I had my shop, my guys knew they had 100 hours of training a year. That was advisors and techs. That sounds like a lot, but it's about eight hours a month. And that was in the 90s. What should it be today? Ten times that? Yeah. Well, I don't. That's a lot of hours. <clears throat> but you get what I'm saying? If you're having a problem with that, it's because you didn't talk about it. This is what I'm talking about. When you're hiring people, make sure you're clear on the expectations. Like, they hold you, as an owner, they hold you, the employee, your team member is going to hold you 100% accountable to what you said you were gonna provide. Can we agree on that? I mean, how many employees have ever said, you, you've gone up to them and said, hey, I forgot your paycheck this week. I'll, I'll, get, I'll take you, I'll, I'll catch up next week with you. <laughs> hey, you know that vacation time? Yeah, we're gonna change that. They hold you 100% accountable to what you promised. But as shop owners, most of the time, we're so desperate to get somebody in we don't talk to them about what we need. So they have their expectations clearly defined. We have them in here, but there's this psychological phenomenon called illusion of transparency. And what that means is I unconsciously expect everybody to know what I need. Now, see, I'm a little bit different. My third wife, I met her. And I, I said to her, I said, ma'am, I'm a two by four guy. And she thought it meant something different than what I was talking about. <laughs> what I said to her was, no, whatever you see that you think is obvious, I guarantee you I don't see it. You got to hit me up the side of the head with a two by four and tell me. Like you can, you can hint along. I'm one of them guys. I, it was funny. About probably six years after I got out of high school, I met one of the girls I went through high school with. And we were talking and, you know, catching up. And she says to me, she goes, how come you never asked me out? And I said, what do you mean? She goes, I did everything but just about throw myself at you. So I didn't see it. Right? I didn't know. Guys, how many of us who admit we're oblivious to probably about 98% of the world? Right? I just want to eat. I want to I have some fun. And I want to make some money and provide. Right? That's it. I don't know everything. So you've got to help me with this. So we got to understand that when we're hiring people, we can't expect them to know what we need. We can't expect them to be who we need them to be. Why? Because they don't have the same background, growth, um, education, upbringing, the whole nine yards. They don't have the same values, all that. That's why common sense isn't so common because common sense is actually very personal to each person. Things that seem obvious to you aren't obvious to others. So you've got to be able to understand, I need to let them know. And that's why when I was talking to the students and technicians as well that are listening, that are here now, you want to make sure that you understand what their expectations are. If they don't know what their expectations are, or you hear them say, I want you just to bill hours, run away. You need to understand what their goals are. What are their minimum levels? So you know what the ruler looks like and can be successful. Makes a huge difference. So once you start getting here, what happens is you end up with a better paycheck. 
right? Some of you shop owners, you go through training and stuff like that. And all of a sudden things start to click and you start to make more money. And all of a sudden things are going better and you get more money and you stop. And you're still stuck creating a paycheck. It's just a better one. But that's not the goal or purpose of a business. Please understand that the purpose of any business is to create and keep a client. Now, I got to ask you all a question. It's a little embarrassing. How many of you have thought to yourself or said out loud, this would be a lot more fun if we didn't have customers? But I got to be honest. You know what we call that, don't you? No, a hobby. Right? If you're not getting paid for it, it's a hobby. We need those clients. So the goal, the purpose, I'm sorry, the purpose of a business is to create and keep a client. I don't care if you're a doctor, a chiropractor, a plumber, hairdresser, auto shop owner, you're here to create and keep a client. That is the purpose. The goal of the company is to generate a profit. Profit is the lifeblood of a business. Cash is the oxygen of a business. If you've got too much month and not enough money, your business is, is asphyxiating. So we got to work on that. But let me, under, let me help you understand. The reason we get stuck on that path, right, where we got a better paycheck is because we don't understand the end game. The function of your business is to thrive without the owner. Why do we create legal entities for our business? How many of y'all are LLCs? How many S Corps? C Corps? Good. Don't do a C Corp. Why do we create those entities? This is participatory. I'm sorry? For protection. Right? It's for protection. For protection from who? Legal exposure, yes? That's one of the reasons why we do that, don't we? What we're doing when we create an LLC or an S-Corp, what we're essentially doing is saying to the federal government, the state government is, hey, I'm here and here's this other person and this other person is my shop, okay? And we do that for protection. And as long as you don't pierce the corporate veil, you have that protection. The shop can get sued, but your assets and holdings over here, as long as you don't pierce the corporate veil, or safe. But I also want you to think about it like a child. How many of you have children? Well, some of you, it's pretty obvious. But how many have children? Right? When you have a child, do you want to have that child be completely dependent upon you for the rest of your life? No. We want to help that child. We want to grow that child, right? See, one of my things when I grew up, I was a little weird, in case you haven't noticed yet. I didn't believe my job as a father was to protect my children. My job was to prepare them. Does that make sense? Like my grandson, a couple years ago, he was playing soccer, and I watched the game, and he come running up the hill, and I said, hey, buddy, how'd you do? He goes, great. I said, who won? He goes, it was a tie. And I said, bullshit. It was 11 to 2, you got your ass kicked. <laughs> Why don't we tell kids this? Because here's what we're doing. We're trying to keep our kids in a bubble. And then they hit the real world. And the real world is filled with disappointment and setbacks. And they're not prepared for it. And the reason why I'm bringing this up now is because shop owners, you got some parenting to do with some of your team. You're smiling really hard at me. How come? You know? Tell me. Tell me more. What's your name first? Urban? All right. Part-time teacher. Shop you've had for 10 years. I'm sorry. It's almost like you need a sobriety chip. I've owned my shop for 10 years. Here's my 10-year chip. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's the whole issue. 
it's all the owner, the owner, the owner, the owner. The guys need to realize, hey, they put their part in, it can become something way bigger. Mm -hmm. And I've got the groundwork. I've got the groundwork. But I need to finish it. Yeah. You got to understand. I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to give you a fair warning. Don't talk to him about that. Okay? And the reason being is because he asked me that question. Years ago. And he said, what's your vision? What's your destination? Where the hell are you going? And I kept giving you answers. And he would say, no, that's wrong. That's not right. And I was like, no, I'm telling you where I want to go. And he was right. But you don't have it. So you have to be able to smell it. You have to be able to hear it. You have to be able to see it. You have to be able to envision it. And I realized that I, the reason that they didn't know is because I didn't and I didn't know how to define it. I didn't have the groundwork to do this. I was good at working on cars, but I wasn't a business owner. I didn't understand that I needed to be more on the journey. I needed to be taking people with me to put me in the wrong place. All right? And that's what this is about. That's what this meeting is about. Because we, that's our job. We're helping taking these kids on a journey. We're providing them something. We're getting them somewhere. We're inspiring them. We're giving them passion. But we have to know where we're going. And that is not as easy as we think it is to answer. Well, that's all right. Joe, uh, my mouth didn't even move, right? My, like, Lucas and I have had a long-term relationship, yes? I mean, I was the first non-family member to hold your son. And Alex was very protective of that, believe me. <laughs> so, yes, and... It happens a lot, but as leaders, we need to understand where we're going. We need to understand why we're going there, right? Why is important to us as leaders? Why are you doing this? Why do you go to work? Don't go for a paycheck. Go for something bigger. You're going for a paycheck. You're never going to be anything more than a mercenary. Go for something bigger. So I'm going to give you my favorite why example. So I'm a crazy dude out in the truck. I got two cinder blocks and a 12 foot two by 12. I'm going to set that up right here. I'm going to say, tell you what, everybody, everybody that's here, you start here, walk across that board. I'll give you a hundred bucks on the other side. If you don't fall, I'm going to do it. Don't be bashful. Y'all going to do it. Come on, put your hands up. Right? So now let's take and do that. Why are we doing So why are you going to do it? Someone tell me why you do it for the hundred bucks. Easy money, right? Bragging rights. Especially if you're a little tipsy. <laughs> so now, we're going to go into city. I'm going to take that same board with me. We're going to find two buildings 10 stories high with a 10-foot alleyway. I'm going to put that board across it. I'm going to be on one building. You're going to be on the other one. I'm going to say, hey, everybody, get, a, get up. Walk across this board. I'll give you 100 bucks. How many are in? You're good. There's always one. There's always one. Here's what for why why would you not do it this time? Risk assessment. See, I call that like your vision, and you're like creating a vision, right? And what's that? It's the last thing I see is my insides coming out of my mouth as I land, right? But now let's back up for a sec. Same two buildings, same board. Trisha, tell me about a grandchild. Uh, Liliana. Liliana, how old? Almost two. Two, two is a button. Yeah. Smart as a whip. So Liliana is on one building. You're on the other. That building is burning, and the only way you can get to Liliana is going across that board. No question. Would you agree? That is the power of why. When you understand why you're doing something, how doesn't matter. Right? Like, I'd be sitting there like I'm a father. Like, mothers love their kids unconditionally. Fathers typically are different. We're conditional. Okay? Do I love them? Like, I have to ask who's my favorite. I got seven kids. Who's my favorite child today? Right? I grew up with my dad looking at me going, do it again. I'll make another one of you. Okay. So, you know, I, I see them burning on the other side, you know, the building burning. And I'm thinking, uh, come here, come here. You can do it. Come on. I'll throw you over a rope, put it on. And if you start to fall, I'll catch you. Right. 
And then I think, well, I could just make another one. And I'm like, no, I'll go over and get them. So I'll go over and get them and I'll throw up afterwards. Right? That's the power of why. We need this stuff when you go to a shop. When you're looking for a shop, work for a shop that has a purpose. Work for a shop that has a vision, that has a destination, they're going somewhere. And you want to be a part of that destination. See, I, I bring up all this crazy stuff, but I promise you, I kind of bring it back. Right? I bring it back so it makes sense. You've got to understand that your job as an owner, when you buy a shop, it's a different skill set. Or when you start your own shop, you've got to learn numbers. You're going to live and die by your numbers. You've got to learn how to read P&Ls and balance sheets and cash flow statements. You've got to be able to handle and, and, and handle money. You know, I once asked one of my team members, I said, who pays you? And she goes, you do. I went, no, the clients do. I just manage the money. And profit is not a bad thing. See, profit, I believe, is the, is the applause of our clients telling us we did a great job. Profit's not a dirty word. Profit allows me to do amazing things. How many of you as shop owners want to offer more benefits to your team? It means making more money, right? How many of you want more time off? It means more money. So we're not going to be, we're not going to use the ruler. Money's not a, our focus. The money's the ruler. It's showing us how well we're doing at loving on our clients. And yeah, we got to love them. We got to love our team. Your team is just internal clients. You got to get to know each and every one of them. And one of the big problems we have in our industry is we play the game of business like it's a game of checkers where we treat everybody exactly the same way and it doesn't work. Business is a game of chess where you have different pieces that move different ways, have different strengths and weaknesses. And it's your job as the owner of the business to orchestrate that and get it so that you win. How am I doing on time? All right. Okay. Your job as a business owner is to create a business that doesn't need you. See, that's the difference. See, we have the purpose generate uh, to create and keep clients. Goal, generate a profit. But then there's the function of a business. And the function of a business is to thrive without the owner. 83% of companies fail when the owner leaves. And it doesn't have to be that way. It's because most owners, they build the shop around themselves. I don't want to do that. I want to build a shop so that I could literally take myself out of the picture and the shop has a destination. They have a purpose. We have a ruler. And we have feedback. And now I can start to take some time. And you know what's really funny? I'm finally getting shop owners to this point and they're freaking out. Because when I start, when I'm up as an advisor, do I have a direct impact on it? making money for the shop. If I'm fixing cars, do I have a direct impact on making money for the shop? And I'm going to say this to technicians and the students. You want to know when you're going to be in a good shop? When the owner doesn't work on anything. That's what it's going to look like. They actually have a bunch of responsibilities. But they're different. If we look at your shop like a body, a human body, technicians are the hands. Advisors are the ears and the mouth, but the owner is the brains. The owner's looking forward, forecasting, looking for upcoming challenges, opportunities to take advantage of. They're working on their finances. They're growing a culture that makes it so that you want to stay there. They're attracting the best 
people that they possibly can so that as the business grows, they can have, they can add to the team. There's nine responsibilities that a shop owner has to work on their business. But so few do. And that's why businesses are like they are. Shops are like they are. Shops are up and down and up and down. It's because we don't have anybody at the damn wheel. Nobody's driving the bus. Now, the number one rule, if we look at the business as a bus, the number one rule is to keep the people in the bus, not under it. Right? So when I have a problem, it's my fault. We sent an email out about three months ago, and it had a couple of errors in it. I had, I had a uh, half a dozen people reach out. They were happy. They were very happy to let me know we made a mistake. Okay? At which point I said, I'm really sorry. I made a mistake. Uh, I found out what it was. It's not going to happen again. Thank you for letting me know. I didn't th Did I do the email? No. I'm too busy doing other stuff. Right? But I didn't blame anybody. That's not my job as a leader. I accept, the, I accept responsibility. And I deflect credit. One of the coolest things you will ever do as an owner or an advisor is when you have somebody come back and go, oh my gosh, my car's running so good. And you say, hold on a second. Can I get, let me get Joe. He's the one that worked on the car. Let me get Joe. And you bring Joe up front and he's not going to be comfortable listening to it. Or her. Joe could go either way. But you end up with a situation where that text feet will not touch the ground for the rest of the day. Is that true, technicians, or not? It's nice to know we make a difference, isn't it? And we got to be careful out there today. It's different being a technician today than it was when I was a tech. Didn't have the distractions and the different things going on that we do today. And one of the most dangerous distractions today is this. We react to every bing, ding, bang, boom, dazzle, razzle, fuzzy, whatever. How long does it take to make a mistake on a car that could potentially kill somebody? Like that. So you got to be careful with these. You know, it was funny. I was talking to somebody. Uh, I was talking to a tech. and said, you don't need it. Put it away. Put it in your car. Leave it in your car. He's, what if my wife calls? Call the shop. That's what we did. And, and for you youngins here, y'all survived. <laughs> right? It was funny. I got a, one of my assistant coaches is, is a, a new grandfather. And his daughter I have known since she was that high. And she's really very, very protective of the ch her baby. And she, she had these posts recently like, it's, it's fall time again. People are getting sick. Don't kiss babies. Don't talk to them close. And I started laughing the other day with her dad. And I said, you know, she survived. Right? I mean, when, we were, I mean, when my kids were younger, I kissed them all the time. How many else did that? Right? I got grown adults now. My oldest is 42. My youngest is 27. Right? So we kissed them. We hugged them. We breathed in their faces. I coughed at them. Right? I didn't care. Whatever. I'm going to tell you this. She's worried about the kid getting sick. Wait till that kid goes into daycare. That's a damn Petri dish right there. She's never going to bring stuff back that scares penicillin. Right? But we've got to get back to this. We've got to know where we're going. So make sure you know where you're going if you're going to get hired by somebody. Be picky. You deserve it. Okay? Sometimes it's not going for the dollar. Sometimes it's going for the potential. But just make sure the potential is there. Now, try and think, which is unusual for me. So we've talked about always be learning. We've talked about what to look for in a shop to be health, happy and healthy in it. Eric, you just stood up. Eric, we're, what? I know your story a little bit. You were working. So he moved from New York down here to North Carolina because Lucas lied his teeth off 
No. I was the one who got catfished, okay? Oh, you got catfished? Yeah. 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 But you guys have been together now for how long? <laughs> Funny, he was saying the same thing. <laughs> no. But do you understand? Be willing to respect yourself enough to be a part of a team that matters. To be somewhere that you feel like it makes a difference. Okay? There's so much potential out there. And I'm telling you, this is an exciting time. We are no longer like Gomer Pyle and stuff like that. We're more like Jordy LaForge today. Can we agree? Star Trek Next Generation. Good, good. No, hey, no problem. Well, then they don't deserve to be in this room. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, but he's not getting calls on it. He's getting calls up here. He's getting calls up here. Right? And the tricorder isn't, the tricorder isn't telling you how many likes and, 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 and thumbs up and stuff your, your posts are getting. Right? I'm sorry, social media is a dangerous, dangerous tool. Yeah, let me know how that's working for you, Jim. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, I want to thank everybody. I want to open this up to some questions. Wow, that actually scares me a little now. <laughs> Nothing like setting the bar up high. Some of my some of my best management training is stop it. <laughs> or stop stopping. Keep going. But seriously, any questions? I would love to answer any questions at all. I've been a tech, I've been a manager, I've owned shops. So anything I can do to help, please ask. Yes, sir. Yep. So I'm not I'm not ready to ditch my my coaching company. Okay. I think they're uh, I know that they're well respected. Um but is there something else aside from hiring another one? Can I get you offering both during what it's like that I'm not sure if I read up on so that I can coach my coaching company and say I wanna learn this? Can we talk about this? Yeah, I didn't. I I promised. I didn't ask him to ask me that question. I'm not paying him for this question. So he's asking. He's had a business full time for two years. First, thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. I think that's important. Um, so the first thing I would say to do is talk to your coaching company. If you don't feel like you're getting what you need from them, talk to them about the help you do need. Okay. Now, should you be concerned about billing properly and stuff? Absolutely. 
doesn't make it any, you're not there to fix cars. When you own a business, please understand you're not there to fix cars. You're there to create and keep relationships, right? It's a whole different ball, ball of wax. Now, one of the worst things you can do, and what's your name? I'm sorry. Josh? Yeah. SH? Yes. Yeah. All right. So I'm old. I can't hear crap. All right. So, Josh, the worst thing you can do is have one person over here telling you one thing and another person over here telling you something else because it creates a traffic jam right about here. Okay? And it doesn't work. What I would suggest you do is, number one, if you'd like, you're welcome to come to our Shop Owners Roundtable. We have a roundtable every other uh, Thursday, second Thursday of every month. And you can go to our website, 180biz.com, and right on top it says, join the next uh, roundtable. It's absolutely free. It's an hour from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern. And there's typically 50 to 60 shop owners in there. And we just talk about what's going on in the shops. Okay? Welcome to do that. We also have a webinar series. In fact, can we, hey, Roy, can we get it back on my computer, please? Um, we have a giveaway for today. It's a bundle of three webinars. It's a uh, growing your business with confidence and then two KPI webinars to help you understand what your key indicators are and what you should be shooting for, okay? That's absolutely free. We're gonna give that away to you. Uh, but we have a webinar program, it's once a month. It's called the Pocket Business Genius Series. Uh, so if you want something with that, you're more than welcome to wait, uh, either visit our site or you can see me after. Uh, but I would ask you to sit down and talk with your, your coach and tell them, listen, I understand where we're going this way. I have, I have fires over here I need help with. And if they won't help you with that, then you need to start to think about something different. But give them a chance. Does that help at all? Yeah, absolutely. If I, I want to give them a chance. Absolutely. I don't know who it is, but absolutely. There's a lot of good coaches out there, right? I am not the only good coach. I am a good coach, but I am not the only good coach. Okay? So I hope that helps, Josh. Thank you. You're very welcome. Anybody else? Right. Because we don't know what questions to ask. We don't know what we need to be looking at. We know how to fix cars. And it, it is a completely different game than fixing cars in other businesses. It really is. And, you know, Benji and I have had the pleasure of working together now for a while. It's been awesome. 47 years. 47 years. <laughs> 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 Hey, Matt, yep. you ever had your ass kicked by a 61-year-old? <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> sometimes it seems like that, though, doesn't it, Benji? But, but I mean, there's a lot of truth in that. Yeah. Going in, again, fix the cars and leave them. You know, whenever you, whenever you start talking about running a business and, and what numbers you have to follow and keep up with, We actually create the problems. Oh, yeah. You know, and what Einstein once said, you can't solve a problem with the same level of intellect that created it, right? So our problems force us to get better unless we, unless we fall in love with our problem. And please don't do that. So Lucas at one point said to me, Rick, in the very beginning goes, when do I get rid of all my problems? And I laughed and I said, that is the easiest question you've asked me. The only people without problems live in cemeteries, right? Problems are a sign of life. When I own a business, the only problem with problems I have is if I'm dealing with the same problem today that I was a year ago. That means I'm stuck, okay? You want new, better problems. What's going to happen is I create this problem. So I start to research it, and I learn, and I solve that problem. But in the process of solving that problem, I just created my next problem. That's the way life goes. And that's what makes us grow and become bigger, better people. I'm going to tell you that 
owning a business is probably the strongest, most powerful self-development tool you will ever find because it gives you immediate feedback and it's very painful if you don't change things, right? But it can also be an amazing journey. You know, when I start to work with somebody that's literally one week from closing their doors to what, four years later, five years later, 10 bay, 10 bay shop. That's amazing, right? That's when my feet don't touch the ground, which takes a lot. I don't know if you've noticed, but. And the, the problem is the cycles, right? Because we, as shop owners, we're in the cycle. I'm particularly talking to you. I mean, that's the thing, right? I'm in the cycle. I'm in the cycle. Right. Well, but so here's the thing about the cycle. What is the cycle? The cycle is that we're trying to fix all the problems. I'm the center of the wheel. Right? You got to get these cars yeah. out here, man. Do it all. Once I get all these cars out, man, everything will be okay. I checked all these cars, all these problem cars, all this stuff's doing. I checked it all done. And I'm going to get it all done, and that's going to fix the problem. And then guess what? You look at the checking account. You run out of cars, you run out of money. You look at the checking account when you fix all those problem cars. Really? I did all that for this? Like I once told somebody that if I figured out what I paid myself an hour when I first got the shop, I would have to report myself to the Department of Labor because I was paying myself less than minimum wage. How many of us are there now? Think of the number of hours you put into the shop. Think of the number of hours that your life is being sucked dry just because you're not at the shop, you are in a constant state of worry and anxiety because of it. How many of you have had a spouse look at you and say, hey, I'm tired of you coming home and having the lights on, but nobody's home because you're at the house and all you're thinking about is every mistake you made at the shop, right? And then you get up the next morning, you feel like crap because you wasted a night with your family. And we actually start getting upside down where we're at the shop worrying about our family and we're at home worrying about the shop. We got it upside down. So we've got to get this cycle broken. And the way we're going to do that is to start to create that destination, that vision of where you really want to go. And please understand, it's not fixing cars. That's just the vehicle, pun intended, that you're using to create relationships and generate a profit. That's what it's there to do, right? I hope that makes sense to y'all. And there was another question to us. Yeah. So how do you want to see the you know, five hundred one where you want to be Oh, I got an answer for you. Have I got what's your name? Nico. Okay. Don't call me sir. That's name calling. I ain't call you a name. Let me, let me tell you what's going to happen. Nico, when you start looking for a job, you want to find a shop where the owner's thinking about retiring. You're going to spend some time getting better at what you do, right? Your job, but then transition to the front counter, transition to managing the shop. And you're going to help that person build the shop up. And instead of starting out on your own, it's gonna be like you're in a relay race. He's just gonna pass you the torch. That's gonna to be the strongest and best way you can do it and then get help doing it. Either through him, him getting a coach and working with both of you. That would be a fantastic way for you to do it. Does that help? Good, 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 thank you. Somebody else, anything, challenge me. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to say something. What's your name, by the way? Scott. Scott? First of all, thank you for asking. How many, of, how many employees are in here? Please raise your hand. Raise them high. George, hi. Jesus, still don't listen to stuff. <laughs> no, listen. How many of you, the moment 
you no longer get what you think you need to get to live, survive, and go where you want to go with your current employer are going to go someplace else. Be honest. Everybody is in it for themselves, Scott, is what I'm trying to get at. Okay. Yeah. So if he don't have that mindset, hey, I'm just here to learn a little bit, and I'm gonna create my own stuff. You know, so it don't matter how much I pay him. It don't matter how much benefits. He's just looking out for himself, and he's gonna go here and maybe even take some of your stuff and split it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Okay. I've got to be super clear about as an owner, when I'm talking to a potential candidate, I got to be super clear about what my goals and expectations are and what my expectations are as far as how they're going to show up. And I got to have four standards in my shop. I got to have a standard for, well, two of the standards are client facing, two are inward facing. I have to have a standard for quality. So that regardless of who's working on the vehicle, we're going to get the same des consistent desired end result. Does that make sense? We also need to have a standard for experience. And that's how it feels doing business with you. So if you have more than one person that deals with the client, it's going to feel the same. They're going to get, same, they're going to get asked the same questions. They're going to get treated, pardon me, the same way. Does that make sense? Those are the two outward facing standards. Then we have two inward ones. The first one is standard for performance. Every person in your shop should need, should know exactly what their stretch goal is, what their mid range goal is and what their, the minimum level is. Okay. In certain areas, you got to figure those out, right? They're going to, I have a, a way of doing that, uh, but yours might be a little different. And they need to understand that they're going to get feedback. And because we're constantly and never, you know, never ending improving, we're going to expect to see that getting better and better. Right. But then there's also a, a standard for behavior. How do we treat each other? What are our, what are we focused on? See, if I have a strong enough why and purpose, I'll start to weed some of those guys out that are completely self-serving. Those guys, I'm guessing you have one of those guys. Okay. And I'm guessing they don't go to training. And I'm guessing they don't take part in any extracurricular activities as a group. Am I close? He doesn't belong there. And here's the thing. Do you think that attitude he has is contagious? Who said that? Someone just felt what I just said there, <laughs> right? I thought somebody just saw Jesus. Uh, yeah, that attitude's contagious. So the worst thing, you, the hardest thing to do, Scott, is to let go a high-performing toxic team member. Okay, yes. And they take that passion and they grow a business. I think that's what we all strive for. Good, yes. healthy competition. Competition that, you know, the industry is making what they deserve. Now, the person that's not a team player. Different story. Let them go on their own. Let them, you know, not be mentored, not be exposed, not respect their peers. And we all know we're going to see that failure. But I think growing that individual, like you so that I think we do, but here's the thing, Scott. I'm going to tell you that if Nico were in your, let's say I'm 35 years old, Nico comes in, he wants to start his own shop. I'm going to make it, I'm going to do everything I can to provide him an opportunity where he won't feel the need to. I'll, I'll open a second location, 
and it, I'll get him in charge of that second location, right? The only, I believe the only reason people leave is because they don't see a future. I want to help them see that future with me, okay? Now, if Nico wants to own a shop, that's fantastic. If he tells you he wants to own a shop, but he's fully committed to training and learning and everything like that, then I'm, I'd, I'd have him in there and I would start to get him involved because maybe what will happen is he starts to see some of the str struggles. You got to remember, Scott, there's a curtain. Nico's on this side of the curtain and the curtain has a picture of a rolling hill and a valley and there's this beautiful cabin and a lake and there's a fishing pole there and, and the sun's there and it's just beautiful, right? And that's what shop ownership looks like to him right now. Now, how many of you are on the other side of that curtain going, yeah, it ain't that way, right? Why not bring him behind the curtain so he can see some of what goes on and has to deal, sees what you have to deal with? Because maybe all of a sudden he's going to go, wow. And by the way, when you start out, you're going to start out working 18 hours a day, billing three hours right? And there's going to be a, just like, it's going to look like an old Amco commercial where just stuff's falling off as you're walking, right? You got relationships and everything else in the background that got burned because of part of this. So maybe seeing that he'll decide, maybe I want to change the trajectory a little bit, still have the same passion, but why not keep it in, in house? But if they're not a team player at all, don't waste your energy, right? It's like uh, in Virginia, we say it's like teaching a pig, pig to sing, right? You frustrate the pig and you piss yourself off. Don't, don't waste your time on that stuff. Get team players, create a great team, and show them growth. The better you shop owners are able to plug into your team and understand what their individual goals and dreams are, and as long as you can show that working with you helps them get what they want, you're gonna have an engaged team. You gotta understand that leadership is getting other people to do what you want for their reasons, okay? And the better I understand what their reasons are, the more engaged they're going to be. Does that help? Okay. Better communication, yeah, but... But, but that part of communication that we really suck at is listening. Yeah. As shop owners, we tend to just, yeah, bub, 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 bub. it's like a machine gun. Stop and ask questions, right? Sit down, do a one-on-one. -on -one. How many of you have a personal development plan for each one of your team members that have three, three, three personal goals and three business goals that they want to achieve for the next year? And then are you meeting with them quarterly to see how they're doing and give updates and, and guidance and such like that. And then meeting with them daily to let them know how they're doing on hitting their day-to-day -day tasks. We don't talk enough to the people about the right stuff. We go in and we ask them, hey, how was the weekend? Who cares? Like I do, but you understand what I'm saying? We gotta talk about bigger stuff. What do they want out of life? How can I help Nico have a better life? Right? How can I help Josh have a better life? That's what it's all about. Because then I have a following. You know, John Maxwell once said, if, if, you think, if you think you're a leader, but nobody's following, you're just going for a walk. Right? So you've got to have that passion. Where are you going, Scott? I mean, these are the questions I would start with you. We want it to be bigger than fixing cars. Right? We could be serving a community. We could... Um, there are some shops, I, I heard of one shop, I think it was in Wisconsin, that they were basically a nonprofit. All the profits went to help battered women. And that was their whole focus, right? They would fix cars for them and then retail people would come in and the profits from that would feel, fuel the programs and, and fix in their cars. Uh, get something like that that means something to the community, if that makes sense. That's what I would do. Somebody else. What would you recommend to a shop owner that is extremely passionate about what you're talking about? Get a damn good manager. You're still going to be the owner, 
and you've got to wear your owner hat, right? We call them hats. So I have an owner hat, a manager hat, an advisor hat, a tech hat, a clean the toilet hat. You know, I've got them all, right? If you love fixing cars, that's great. Fix cars. But get somebody that understands you still have to have the vision. You still have to have the destination. You still have to have the purpose. You hire a manager, but you've got to be able to – he's going to – that manager, he or she – has got to make sure that they're hitting the numbers that you want them to hit, right? The, 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 the whatever goals they are. So you still manage that manager as an owner. Does that help? Yeah, and you know, the other thing is, never mind, I forgot. I'll get it back. Go ahead. Who else? Come on, bring it on. Don't be scared. Yes. Speak up. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Yep. That's right. Culture. And what's your name? I'm sorry. That's a great question. So one of the best ways. So first of all, what was your name? Brian. So Brian brought up the fact that culture is everything. That, that I've been talking a lot about that. And it's true. I want to just... How many techs or owners have worked at a shop, got paid really well, and it actually sucked to work in that shop, right? It was so toxic. Everybody's pointing fingers like this. Nobody cared. It was just horrible. You just couldn't wait to get to the end of the day. By the end of the week, you're exhausted. Yeah, you're making great money, but man, you can't live with yourself. You can't wash that stuff off. I've been in that. That transmission shop was one of those shops. Everybody was in it for themselves. Nobody cared. It was horrible. The best thing you can do, my suggestion, if you're thinking of a shop, is sit down and talk to the people working there. Don't talk to the owner. Talk to the people that are working there. And here's what I would ask them. One question. What do you love about working here? That is a powerful question. What do you love about working here? He doesn't, you know, you, you're going to be surprised at how many answers you get. One guy might say he doesn't yell at me. How many of us have had people yell at us? Call us names, berate us, belittle us. This is a high erosion industry. And we got to stop supporting those high erosion shops. We got to start finding shops that truly care. Yeah, the owner might be in the back office. He's working or she's working. It's not like they're not doing anything. Trust me, they got a heavy load to carry. I guarantee you every owner in here takes the responsibility of paychecks very, very seriously. They don't just have to provide for their families. They have to provide for everybody else's family as well. It is a heavy load. And when we see cars start to slow down a little bit, trust me, shop owner starts thinking like a country song in a nanosecond, right? Shop slow. Not going to be able to make payroll. People are going to quit. Not going to be able to pay my bills. Going to lose the shop. My wife's going to leave me. My kids won't love me. My dog's going to pee on my leg and the truck's going to catch on fire. Right? Is that a country song or what? And we do that in a nanosecond. Every time we get slow. Every time there's a problem. I'm going to tell you guys, technicians and students, the best thing you can do working with a shop is be honest. If you're having a problem with something, don't let it fester. Sit down and talk to somebody. Say, hey, man, you said something the other day. It kind of pissed me off. Now, it's okay to say that, but expect the best. I say that to my clients all the time. Well, this is happening. We make up stories about that stuff all the time. Don't believe the story. 
If you believe you're working for a good person, give that person a benefit of a doubt. And owners, if you have good people working for you and they do something that seems cynical, uh, uh, criminal or whatever it is, give them the opportunity to talk. Ask them, hey man, this is the way this is hitting me and I'm sure it's not that way. Can you help me understand? We don't communicate enough with each other, right? We don't ask enough questions. It's so important, you know? Um, Tell you what, I got, I got for shop owners that you're interested, um, let me know. I'll give you my business card, or whatever. Rick at 180biz.com. Um, where's my thing? Oh, my leg. So I'm going to give you an email address. If you guys want, I've got this thing called temperature check questions. These are just questions to ask your team to see how engaged they are, right? Can there be different levels of engagement? Like I can be emotionally invested, just I'm part of the team, end of story. And it's amazing. Or I could be emotionally disconnected, but still care about doing a good job. Or I could be there just trading time for dollars, couldn't I? And that's the sad part. So you wanna know how invested and engaged your team is? If you want, just send me an email. I'll send you those, I got like 50 of them, I think. I'll send them to you, okay? Now, any other questions? Do we have any online? No, okay. All right, hold on one sec. So don't you get up. Here's a QR code. We're giving a webinar bundle away. It's called Growing Your Business with Confidence. And then there's two KPI webinars as well. This is absolutely free, no expectations. Just put your camera up to it. Don't take a picture of it. I used to do that, that's wrong. Put, a, put your camera up to it, click on the little button that says open in Chrome or Google or our Safari. Fill out the little form and you've got access to those three webinars, absolutely free. Um, for those of you that are online, Lucas is gonna post the link. Well, first of all, you do have one question. Okay. If you're a one-man shop, what kind of self-reflection it takes to develop your culture and values to create a positive culture, develop with one-man shop? Well, that's a great question. Um, that's a great question. Ooh. Here's my answer and it's a question. How are you treating yourself? Are you beating yourself up all the time? Or are you being progressive and solutions oriented and thinking of the future or are you stuck in the past and all the mistakes you've made the culture starts there get the business doing enough so you can hire someone to get some more free time so that you can build more hours and then as you grow you get more sales you got you hire somebody else and then you grow more sales and you hire somebody else each and every one of us should have three core things that we do in the shop those are your strengths those are where you add the most value and the most money for the shop. So for me as a coach, we did this a while back. My top three are coaching, training, okay, and building content. So that's, we do everything we can to keep me doing those key three things all the time. And we've done that with each person in our staff so that we're maximizing the output that we have with the business. Does that make sense? So we're getting a lot more revenue with the small staff that we have than I ever expected to do. And it's because of that thought process. So start off, bill your hours, get enough to hire somebody, build, build more hours, and then just keep growing it and growing it until you've worked yourself out of a job. Okay, so anybody that wants that, here's my email. Uh, it's info at 180biz or rick at 180biz.com. Feel free, you can uh, shoot me that email. I'll send you those uh, temperature check questions. Uh, and if you need any help at all, I'd, I'm happy to sit down and talk with anybody. Um, free shop owner round table, second Thursday every month, uh, 180biz.com, right at the top, it just says join. Uh, and we'll send you a text reminder and everything for it. Um, who's been in the shop owners round table before? Matt, you have, Todd has, yeah, there's been a bunch. So yeah, Carlos, you've been in it, right? It's not bad. It's great. Yeah, thank you. So, all right, everybody, thank you so much for today. I appreciate your time. Hope I made sense. Hope to help. Thank you. All right, y'all, here's the game plan. You're going to get up, you're going to go to the back, and there's a bunch of tables set up. We have merchandise and stuff we're giving away for the podcast. We gave a bunch away last night. There's not much left for the podcast. There's ASTA stuff. There's water bottles. There's hats. There's everything you could want. And there's pound cake back there. 
You're going to get up, you're going to get that, go outside and get your food, come back in and eat, and Roy is going to start the advisory council meeting here in just a few minutes. So try and hurry up, get in, get your food, and then we're going to do a student panel here in just a little bit. So uh, don't head out just yet, all right? Thank you. Huh?
right there. All right, folks, uh, I hope everybody's got their belly full or in the process of doing it. I'll take a few minutes and cover some business for the program, for our advisory board here and, and talk a little bit. And uh, then we'll do a student panel and we got some giveaways for the students there. Again, my name is Roy Jennings. I'm the director of the program and I want to thank all of y'all for coming out, spending your Saturday with us. And I want to thank everybody from AST and uh, Changing the Industry podcast, uh, everybody that has helped support and sponsor this event today. I hope you guys have learned something. You've got something to take away from it. Uh, it's the biggest event that I've been involved with here at the program, and I appreciate that. Uh, some of the things that I wanted to cover as far as our advisory board uh, and there was an interesting podcast the other day where there was discussions about advisory boards across the nation at different schools and do they really have input and do the school systems actually listen and take that information? Here at Caldwell, the answer is yes. And there are a couple of members of the advisory board that are here today. Uh, there's one individual that was on an evaluation team back in 2015 that helped evaluate the program for reaccreditation and a resounding yeah where there are schools probably across the state across the nation that does not take the input from industry we value that and when you look around this garage and these classrooms i can point all over to things that are a direct influence of the advisory board when you look at the yellow traffic lanes in the floor that was not just a recommendation, but a design of the advisory board on how and what we should do. When you look at these three new lifts on the front side of the building, brand new rotary, we got rid of some old Western lifts. That was direct input from the advisory committee. And the, the first point on my agenda I want to talk about is a thing we call a POA. And in education, it's a plan of action. I have an operating budget to work with for the program throughout the year to buy things we need, small things under $500. And it's remained the same through COVID, hard times, and it's about $23,000 a year. I've got the same amount this year. So we've not taken a budget hit like a lot of colleges across the state. We're doing good on that. But if I want to buy something that is more than what would be considered supplies, we put it on a plan of action, each department at the college does, and it gets voted on all the way up to the executive council at a budget retreat to decide the funds that are available, which department is a priority to get that funding. So every year we put five things on there, and those five things are direct report from the advisory committee. I ask your input, and those things that we had on our uh, plan of action are new scan tools, cutaway hydraulic clutch system trainer, reinstate part-time budget lines, develop and implement a light diesel program, and a disc brake ABS trainer. Now, out of those five things, <coughs> excuse me, the light duty diesel program that we had talked about implementing we've kind of put that one to bed because last year the college started a heavy diesel program so we're not really looking at that based on input from the advisory committee as far as new scan tools i'm happy to you know announce that two weeks ago we were approved for those and i've got them ordered i've got five lower level scan tools that are all tails that'll match one that we have. 
and we're getting their top dog EV uh, scan tool that'll do everything, including a lab scope. So these students will be able to work with some new stuff. My scan tools were getting old and outdated. I, I can't just go buy one. It, it's not the way state budgets work. But having that on the plan of action, input from the advisory committee, we've got that coming. As far as a cutaway trainer for a clutch, and the disc and drum ABS trainer, uh, those will go on the plan of action for next year. We'll just roll them over and see if funding is available. So today, as you're looking around the program, talk to the instructors. If they're dressed like this, they work for me. Talk to the students and see what could improve the program. What could this place use to help bring that education up a notch? In the end, it's all about benefiting the student. It's not about getting what Roy wants or what Jacob or Dustin wants. It's what's gonna benefit the student. I have to turn the plan of action in, the new one in the 15th of December. So what you advise and recommend today will be on my plan of action. When we do our spring advisory board, hold me accountable, it'll be there. Now, if I get 50 things, I can only put five things on it but I'm gonna look for the most concise items that you see or recommend that we need. And we will put those in. As I mentioned, our budget for the year has remained the same for what it is last 10 years. It's sufficient to do what we need on the supply side of things. Uh, so we're in good shape there. Uh, as you're walking around, look at the tools and equipment that we have. Uh, and see if there's anything that you see out of, out of the way. Uh, as far as the course of study and how we deliver our instruction, and here's another example of how the advisory board had a direct influence on that. Prior to COVID, we delivered instruction old fashioned five days a week, face to face, everything. During COVID, we had to pivot. Is that what they say on Friends? Pivot, pivot. My wife says that. I don't know what it means, but pivot. So we pivoted, and for a while we had to go online, and you know you can't teach nobody how to fix a car online. And then we came back and did the labs in person, and then we were back and forth, and then we went back full time. And when we went back full time, students struggled because they were used to just not being here. We have gone to and implemented a blended schedule where the student does some of their instruction online. We have lectured to all of the chapters, recorded them in the PowerPoints and have a private YouTube channel and post them every week. Their chapter questions are online. They show up Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and they come in to answer any questions and get out here and do the labs. That's the way we've, we've been doing it. As an ASC accredited program, we're not allowed to have any more than 25% of instruction online. That's fine. We are well below that 25%. So it's not like we're trying to cram everything online. The only class that we have 100% online is shop management. And uh, Mr. Ray back here, one of our students, uh, he is first time here with us, finishing his degree up, and he is in that class taking it online now. You can ask him how that's flowing that class doesn't really have labs, so online it works out. Uh, we took a vote a couple of years ago on whether to go traditional and stay with that or do the blended, and the vote was six to three in favor of going to the blended schedule. So the way the instruction is delivered was a direct vote influence from the advisory committee. So don't, don't think in your shops is a tech or is an owner that you don't have an influence. We take what you say very seriously and we take it and apply it. What we do at the community college is for you. You're the, the place where the end result is going to, your industry. You know, our product is education. We use education to change lives, to train people, and we're gonna send them to you. So we want to provide for you the product that you require. So please, whether you're here or if you're not local, be a part of an advisory committee. 
let them know what it's going to take to to give you the product you need. Uh, come see me while we're walking around doing different things and let me know your thoughts and I'll be glad to write them down and pass this on to administration. I do want to thank the students that are here today. Um, I know Eric and Dustin did a fabulous job last night. Uh, Eric being the DPI or the high school automotive instructor. Dustin works for me and he provides the college classes up there. But uh, it's a marriage made in heaven, the programs and having both of those two work together. They get along. You could see when they were standing on the tables, they get along and work so good together. They really bounce off each other. And the passion, if you were there last night, the passion that they share for their students. I'm beyond proud of, of both of these guys and seeing them come into the industry and what they've been able to do in a short amount of time. And, and Eric is like Superman this year, teacher of the year for Watauga in um, something for the stuff. What is it? Huh? 50-50 chance of being regional. Well, which half of them is going to win it? I think he's got a good shot. Eric's done a great job coming in, uh, and I really appreciate them. Having part of the program at Watauga High School and Dustin up there, it's nice that I don't have to worry about. Uh, Mr. White talked about, you know, when you're managing things, if you got people doing stuff, don't go do it for them. It's nice to know that Dustin's up there doing the college thing, and I don't have to go in and do it for him or correct him on a lot of things. He, he takes care of it. He calls me if there's problems. We'll talk in the morning. How's it going? You need something? No. You good? We're good. And when there's a problem, we address it. We attack it. It's done. We move on. Next problem. And there will always be problems, just like Lucas said, Mr. White. Any industry, anything you do, whether it's garage, if it's education, there will always be problems. It's all about how you handle it, how you deal with the stress and don't let it eat you up inside, you know? We'll fix it and we'll move on. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask me while you've got me strapped to a stool? Uh, I think my biggest question for you is, is when we talk about instructors, and right now you're in a pretty good spot, but you know you've got a national audience right now, they're listening to us. Where are we on instructors? Are you seeing enough instructors coming into uh, skilled trade education as a whole? And how do you feel about that? No, uh, I don't see it. And, and there's a couple of reasons for that. The last couple of hiring committees that we had, we had very few applicants. Uh, when Dustin applied up at Watauga, extremely few uh, for that location. Education doesn't pay what I can make in a shop. So if you've got somebody in the shop that's turning hours and they're making 70 grand a year, and you tell them, hey, we'll pay you thirty-five, forty thousand a year to teach. Yeah, the benefits are good. The retirement's there, or it used to be there. But am I going to give up half my pay to do this? And when I got into education, I had some other reasons other than just pay. I knew it would pay less. But I did it for family. I raised three boys. My youngest one was 13, and my two oldest ones, when, when they were young, I was working in the shop, working late, and just beating those wrenches to death all the time. I missed out on birthday parties, graduations, a lot of events. I'm crying up like a Korean romantic comedy here, dadgummit. My youngest son, when he was 13, and I got a call and an opportunity to go into education, it was about investing in his life before he went through the teenage years, grew up, and left the house. So I took the pay cut to invest in him. And at some point, he reached an age that, you know, dad wasn't fun to hang out with no more. I'm not cool. And at that point, the old man retired. They asked me to be director, and so I'm here 12 months. But the joy that I have found working with students and every fall when there's a new group that comes in, I don't not want to be here to see who that new person is because this semester I got to meet Nico and yeah he's a little strange but he grows on you like a fungus you know 
and now he's working in a shop. He's doing well. He's got a bright future. And Mr. Peterson back here, he is my work study. He works for me part-time here in the department and helps me keep the place clean. And when you look around and you think the shop's clean today, think that young man right there. He's been scrubbing himself to death, you know. And I, I see Lou right there with, with the sun coming in the back. I just see your hair going like that. I know that's you. And uh, Lou has been very in, inquisitive and intent on learning his stuff there. And then Mr. Posey to the right of him moved up from Florida, decided he wanted to go to college and joined us. And, uh, you know, it's been a joy to have him in here. He likes rabbit and can't find rabbit. If somebody's got any rabbit or gator in the backyard, he's looking for home cooking. <laughs> Who else have I got? Oh, young man here that's working at Mr. Irvin. Irvin was a teenager in my first class, and now Irvin owns a shop, and this young man, and I forget your name, young man, because I don't teach you. Doug, I should have remembered that. It's simple, through four letters, four letters, three, however many. It depends on how you spell it. Doug, a teenager in our career and college promise class and does good in school. He's doing good in the shop. Uh, you know, we're glad to have him here with us. We got any other students in here that I missed? The eyes are getting old here. I can't see too far. How many former students? I see you. I see AJ. When I were getting beyond my eyesight. <laughs> oh, Dustin. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the two guys that work for me back here, instructors. Uh, Dustin uh, Ford and Jacob Husky. Uh, so back to the original question, is it hard to find instructors? Yeah, nobody's wanting to do it. And those that do want to do it shouldn't be doing it. Well, you know, going through that interview process, I, I've seen people that you shouldn't be teaching anybody anything. So to have that combination at Watauga is magic. And with Jacob coming in with me, well, he just started in January. I'm not done assessing him. But he's doing all right. I'm pretty proud of him. Eric, you had a question. In the high school, a couple of things would have to happen. Uh, one, we would have to show that there's enough students that it would fill the classes. And it may be something that would start out as part-time, which I don't like doing that in the high school because a part-time person isn't vested in it like a full-time one is. Is there room to do it? And, and there may be a lot of students one semester, but is it repeatable to where next semester, next year, and the year after? Because the last thing you want to do is hire somebody, pull them out of a garage, promise them the world, and next year say, we don't have the students, we'll have to cancel the position. It is a possibility. Uh, we, we just have to prove the need and the repeatability of it. And, you know, when we, I know at the high school, you're busting at the seams down here. We went kind of downhill with COVID, and we've been coming back up, growing slowly, trying to get the student base back. Across the state, the community colleges are low. Uh, getting young people to sign up and go to school to want to learn a trade, whether it's automotive, plumbing, electrical, uh, it, it doesn't matter, a recent statistic the president was going over showed that women going to college was beating the boys out two to one. Uh, young men are graduating high school. They're not going into industry. They're not going to school. They're hiding somewhere, and nobody's found out where they're hiding. But the young ladies are coming out. They're going to college. They're going to work. So if you see young men hiding in the woods somewhere, get them out. Send them to school. Send them to work. Uh, so there, there are things that are societal issues, uh, generational issues, and even, even though everybody wants to forget COVID existed, we are still dealing with fallout from COVID and will be for a long time. And there is just a certain generation, a couple of years there, that I have heard people say it's a lost cause to try to save a two-year span. And I, I never believe anybody has lost cause, no matter what your age. So I'll beat my head against the wall to try to help you.
but there are those that believe that coming out of the COVID. There you, there's your hundred word essay for your two word question. Yes. Smart people well around us. We know that in so many ways that has to do with instructor's passion. And I think you can see that the schools that have lots of passion are, are performing very well and they're growing. And like you said, with all the buses and things. Yeah. The schools that don't have a lot of passion are not performing well. And, and you see these programs dying or falling off. What can industry do to help build that passion? Where, where is that passion going to come from? Because I, I see a difference when we're involved. Yeah. I don't think industry knows their place in those meetings and, and being connected with you guys. How can we help? The, the best thing, bridging the gap. Now, Lucas and I, we got so busy going different directions. We didn't communicate very well for a while. A couple of months ago, we talked and we said, we've got to fix our communication. And we started working on that. And things have just been boom, boom, boom ever since. How can you help? get involved with young people at the high school in the automotive program at the community college <clears throat> and be, being on the advisory board is great and we value the input and we implement it but our advisory board meets twice a year and just to show up shake hands spend three hours together twice a year is not enough to make a difference if you're a shop owner or a tech Talk to that local community college and come in and be a guest speaker. Be a guest teacher for the day. Or just come in and hang out in class because the biggest, biggest difference, whether you're an instructor, a shop owner, a mechanic, a student, the biggest thing is building relationships, showing people you care. Not, not just talking a script and walking out of the room. I could walk out of class, go in my office, shut the door and say, I'm, class is over, I'm done with you. But, uh, you know, often, yeah, there's that line coming in and out, and I see that big smile of DePuglio coming in. Hey, you got a second? My truck, fill in the blank. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. That, that is a problem on the educational side uh, where we're passionate, care, and want you involved. Unfortunately, you are going to find schools that that automotive instructor has been there 30 years and he doesn't want outside influence and input. He likes his own little honey hole on what he does with no accountability. And when you have those issues, you go to the administration. If it's a high school, you go to the principal. If you're dealing with a community college, don't be afraid to send an email to the president of the college or the president of the college has a boss. It's called the board of trustees and the board of trustees are the ones that determine whether that president has a job the next day. Contact the board of trustees, contact the president of the college because when they hear that industry wants to get involved, but an instructor doesn't want to, things start to shake up behind the scenes real quick and it might be time to get a different teacher. Talk to the instructor, talk to the department head, and keep going up the chain. Now, you're going to find places across this U.S. that the situation is just so poisoned, you can't find anybody that cares. Go to that next community college that's in the county next to you. Go to the next one. Go until you find somebody that cares and wants to be involved. But don't give up. Don't give up. Get involved somewhere. Does that help? Any other questions? Any comments? Anybody want to throw a hot dog at me? I'll eat a third one. <laughs>
You have to speak up a little louder because I'm old and I can't hear good. Well, Nika, we appreciate you. We appreciate the fact that <laughs> in 14 weeks, your life has changed. First semester, 14 weeks. And yeah, we do care. We, and we don't just care about you learning how to put the pistons back in the block, right? By the way, Eric, the first one he put in, it was backwards. Uh, we fixed that. But we we care about you as an individual. We want you to be ethical. We want you to be honest. We don't want you to be a shyster out here in the garage ripping people off. We want you to do the right thing so that you can go home and sleep at night with a clear conscience and feel good about the money you earned. And we're proud of you, son. We are proud of you. The biggest fears, as we do the student panel and we get them up here, that would be a good question for you to ask them directly. Fears that students come to me when they first start is, I have no experience, what do I say when I walk in the door? Uh, or I'm going to school for this and, and here's something that happens. They hired me, but all I do is wash cars. You know, they didn't go to college for two years to wash cars. They didn't need college for that. Uh, so those are fears. The, the fear of being rejected, maybe, uh, or not being valued. They're, they're scared because people come in and they've got that ASE patch on, and they're like, ooh, I can't do that. When I went to college eons ago with Fred Flintstone, and I had a friend that was a master tech, and I'm like, I'll never be that. I mean, I'm too stupid. You know, I can't, I can't do that. I've been a master tech since 98, advanced since 01, to the point I don't even think about it, and somebody points me out in the grocery store. I'm like, what? They're like, could you get some more bread on the shelf? No, I don't work here. Or they see the snap on, and they're like, will you warranty my wrench? Yeah, give me a thousand. I'll, I'll get it. Rejection, probably. That's probably the biggest one. That would probably encompass it. But ask the student panel when we get started. Any other? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. Now, what is it that for X Y Texas is? I think part of the problem is sometimes also the employers. And how do we get those employers to understand that you're investing in your students directly instead of spending a lot of money to do it? Or even you know, even and it's not just on the subsidy. This is an all over the place. So uh, I know we're going to our Christian program. Right. Mr. Kokona. Do you mind if I do that one more? No, no. Well, let me just ask. No, no, no. So, if, if I'm going to stir the pot, one of the questions that I like to ask is, what about educating students 
Show me what the career path is coming from. Not just go straight all the stickers off the top of you. Right? How are they going to help this new technician continue to advance their career so that we go check in on them two, three, five years later? They're still broke. They're still learning. So I, I hope I didn't blow up what you're asking, but no, no, I think that's part of our conversation. It should be. It, it, should be. it is into kind of go from here back to there. I really want to hit on the fact that I tell my students all the way through the program, you are all valued individuals to the world, to your community, to the automotive industry. You are valued. You're not worthless. Do not let people treat you like crap. Do not let people beat you up, stick you in the corner and just have you washing cars or changing all the rest of your life. If you're in a garage or a situation that's doing that, get out. Do something until you can find something better. Do not let the industry abuse you because there are shops out there that will. These people are valued more than that. Huh? That's not the industry abusing them. That's a shop. That's a shop, not the industry. But the, yeah. Yes. Yes. Right, not the industry. Leave the shop, not the industry. Thank you. Uh, when you talk about attrition and where we start, we always start first-year students. It's a two-year program, and we start with a big class of people coming in. But over time, first semester, a student might decide, this isn't really what I want to do. You know, I'm just dabbling with it to see if, if cars is the industry I want to go in or maybe they're here for personal knowledge they don't really want to do it for career and there are people with a whole host of issues there there are people with life issues i cannot fix and a lot of it's self-imposed some of it's not and we've tried to structure the program so that we use the phrase life happens as you go through the program when you walk out and leave either because you graduated with a degree or because life happened, uh, your girlfriend got pregnant, you had to go to work full time, uh, your mom died, you have to help pay the bills at the house, you're going to leave here with something that's going to make you employable. And for a host of reasons, within two years, that number shrinks to those that actually walk across the stage with the associate's degree. Now, does that mean the success rate is that small? Well, if all you do is look at numbers on paper, Maybe to you it is, but it's not to me. If that individual changed their life, they're in the automotive industry and they're making a productive living and taking care of their family, that's a success. Whether they got a piece of paper hanging on the wall or not, that's a success. And AJ has another former student that works across from him and he's just as good a tech as AJ is because life happened, he couldn't finish the program AJ, it only took, what, 13 years? It, <laughs> it took a while, but life was happening with him. Both of them are successful, so sometimes our success rates, we can't see on a spreadsheet. That, does that answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Yes. I'm allergic. Uh, so, a couple of things that we're hearing from industry is, is that in a lot of ways, you've been, and, and 
You think it would be a good idea for you to share some of your history with us? You're not a member of this school in some way. You, you work with ACAP in a lot of ways. You know a lot of stuff, right? Yeah, just a, a quick bio on me. Uh, I've been in the automotive industry for 35 years. I uh, was working in furniture, and a friend of mine was a service manager at Honda. And having coffee one night, he said, you ought to go to school and learn how to do it right because I was doing it at home on the weekends. And next night, I was sitting in a classroom, and I was in school for two years at night. I went into the industry and worked in independent shops. I owned my own shop for a couple of years. When I shut it down, I went to work for uh, dealerships, new car manufacturers. And I did that for a while until the opportunity came to go into education. I've been a line tech, I've been warranty administrator, I've been shop foreman, I've been service manager, I've been parts and service director, I've been manager of detail. I've, I've done a little bit of everything in the automotive industry and coming into education, Besides just teaching, I've also done work with ASC part-time as what they call an ETL or an evaluation team leader. And I get assignments from ASC and as an independent contractor, I get to go into schools across the state, Virginia, Tennessee, South Carolina, and evaluate their programs. And based on the evaluation, I look at the standard that's in their book, what they're doing, and it's like the old dragnet show, just the facts, just the facts, not opinions, just the facts. And I write a final report and I send it in to ASC. <clears throat> and the ASC committee determines whether they get accredited or they don't based on the results that I find. Uh, so I've had the opportunity to see a lot of programs, meet a lot of instructors. Uh, I've seen good, bad, and ugly. And... Uh, so that's my history. So, now kick the hornet's nest. So that level that, and, and the <coughs> industry feels like in some ways there are schools that are primarily, I don't necessarily want to say funded, but they seem as if they're funneled for, for certain dealer groups or certain types of situations, and they, they funnel the students into what we call the meat grinder. Right. They, them up, they spit them out, right? But they do exactly what Todd was talking about. They throw them in one day. The, the, so that position and that organization, that's what they need right now. Mm -hmm. so that's what they want. That's what they're hiring. They're not trying to grow them. Oftentimes they're saying, hey, why don't you get out of school and you can work for us full time. We'll help train you. We'll help grow you. And we know how that problem is going to happen, right? Right. And, and so, you know, we talk about the bad shots, you know, and, and talk about should that be important. You and I were talking earlier. They're not in this room. They don't come to these events. No, we spent a lot of time, me and my instructors and Lucas and his crew and the high school people, and we beat the ground the last several weeks with flyers going in personally to invite people. And when I look in this room, I see people that are not necessarily from this community. And they had a personal invite. And uh, there were some of them that cursed us just for showing up. Right, Jacob? Yeah. Sent him into a hornet's nest, but. Well, so, so my question is, does the industry of teaching an event like this have an impact on the influence? Because a lot of these guys are saying, I'm not, I'm not going to X school because all they care about is leaving that dealership because the dealership is paying them. How does yeah. that impact? And it depends on the school. In it, any business, it depends on management. Who's managing it? How are they managing it? Yes, there are schools, and they're like, uh, this manufacturer or this dealership is donating so much money, and we're going to just keep sending all of our students there. I've had dealerships and independents come in, and they would say, I want all your students. I want all of them. Well, you can't have them all, because these are individuals that may want to work in an independent, in a fleet, in a dealer. It's their choice. I want to help them get where they want to go. So I'm not pushing them one place. Does it happen? Yeah. And maybe that's why nobody's giving me a bunch of money. <laughs> Thank you for the hot dogs, ASTA. Because <laughs> I couldn't have afforded them. Uh, but I want them to go where they want to go. And for the places that come in and say, I want all your students, they'll come in like a flash in the pan They'll bring some swag or some biscuits. And one day they'll talk to the students 
And if they don't walk out of here with a six pack of students, I don't see them again. I don't hear from them again. And that's okay because then that venture wasn't worth my effort or my students. Does that answer? I get paid by the word to talk, so sometimes I get lost in my own thoughts. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Yes, sir, Eric. Yes. Yeah. I want to hear about some of the places that you've gone that weren't great. You've asked a loaded question, my friend, and I'm live on the internet nationwide. I may never get an assignment to do another ASC school again. Well, I, I don't care because I'm honest, I'm transparent, and I'm too old to change, and I'm going to sleep at night. Uh, I have been to schools where... Well, I think the, the worst one I went to, and I'm going to point at Mr. Corey down here, because years ago, they were supposed to have two people from industry, one from a dealer, one from an independent, and the instructor couldn't even get that together. So last minute, I called Mr. Corey from a dealership, and I said, can you go help do an evaluation ride with me? We drove my little Honda Civic, 94, y'all know what it is, and we went down around Charlotte. Well, I won't say where it is. But the instructor was one of those old set in his ways. I'm going to do my own thing and belligerent. And one of the standards is you have to do a minimum of 20 hours training every year. And I said, you didn't have that. Well, I don't want to. It says you have to. And it's not my opinion. It's in the manual that we all have, if you're accredited, must attend 20 hours of training. Yep, I don't want to. Okay, well, these are no-go, no-go stay. You have to have shields on the grinders. I ain't going to do it. Okay, well, I just write it down there. And he argued with me, and that day it snowed. They closed the schools. We stayed there till 3. They closed at 12. And it reached a point in the closing meeting. I stood up, closed my book, and I told the administrator, I said, I'm done. This meeting's over. I'll submit my report. And he called me three times on the way home to apologize for his instructor, who, by the way, is no longer employed. They got a great instructor at that school now doing a good job. But that was a belligerent man. I've been in schools where the wiring is exposed and hanging down. A hot water heater underneath the sink with wiring sticking up. Okay, water can get in top of the electrical element. Uh, and, and here's where I may never do another AC accreditation event again. School that had that and uh, gasoline and water bottles. I'm talking about a drinking bottle, not marked. And a whole host. I take pictures everywhere I go. And I submitted that. The administrator at that high school thought I was difficult to get along with. I'm just at, here's the standard, show it to me. And I submitted my report, and it wasn't favorable. And ASC, because this individual screamed loudly, was assigned another ETL to come in and they got their accreditation. Now, while their document box was empty, there was nothing in it. There was exposed wiring all over the shop. There was gasoline and bottles. I could just go on and on about the safety issues. I wouldn't let a dog in that shop, you know? Uh, another school that I did now, this, this is a big name brand place, and there were a lot of issues that did not meet no go no standards. And I was put on the phone with the CEO of this school and was told, we have an understanding with ASC. We're not going to do that. Okay, well, I'm just writing my report, and I'm asking questions. So I let ASC know what the CEO said. I sent my report in. They got their accreditation without an issue. So. There's, there's been a lot of talk about, um, again, I'm not trying to set you off, but there's been a lot of talk about some of 
the additional A and C tests. Yeah. And, and in some cases, it would appear that there's been a lowering of the standard to meet some needs of some particular organization. I was involved in an email chain the other day that, that very well documented this in some of their leadership. Um, and so I, I think as an industry, especially if you've got a tech who's a master certified technician, when you're getting that mm -hmm. certification, and all of a sudden you have somebody who has to do less than they have as many certifications as you can and, and appear to a consumer just as well. That is an old text ringtone. Uh, I apologize. <laughs> When you start watering it down, it no longer holds the value that it had. And next year I have to uh, redo my ASCs. It'll be my five years. Um, adding certifications. I know they have the student certifications that some schools like. We don't do it here because if, if I take Nico and have him do student certification and he goes to industry, what value does that have coming into your door? It's not going to let you hang an ASC sign up out there. You know, he's not going to have a patch put on it that says I'm ASC certified. You know, it's just something that says I took a test at school. I'm going to give him tests for two years. Take one of them with you. Okay. Or G1, when you talk about watering down, the G1 is what we call the oil change certification. It's the lowest level. You got to be in the business six months. Uh, and it's just maintenance and light repair. And, you know, there, it doesn't take a lot to get that. I've taken it a couple of times, and the last time, honestly, I slept through the test. I just sit there and click through, and then when I was done, I'm like, hey, I passed. It didn't take much gray matter to get through it. And there may be some people that don't like it, but you know what? It's yeah, That's life. Yeah. Right. And, and as industry, what we're interested in is are they truly confident? Not, not just can they pass a test. Yeah. Are they truly confident? And when you look at ASC tests and, and go to their site, there is a task list or a competency list. And you go down and ask yourself, can I do this, this, and this? And those are actually the competency list we use in education for what the students are doing out here in, in the shop. The tasks that they're doing are those competency lists from the ASC tests. And we deliver them in a lot of different ways. Uh, I'd, I'd have to think about that and go back and compare the list, but I know that especially new tests that have come out have been easy to acquire for people that I've talked to. I know when the, uh, the light duty diesel came out, I was in a, a meeting and the discussion was the questions were so flawed that half the people or more could pass, or you could miss more than half the questions and become certified. So you had people for five years that were light duty diesel certified. That Did they really earn it? No, that's it's like putting the kids through high school and no matter what, giving them a 50. Jim and I could agree on a lot of things, I'm sure. Other, <laughs> we got high. Yeah, like, <laughs> which way do I go with this? <laughs> well, we've uh, kicked the hornet's nest, and I've been about as honest and transparent as I can be. Any other questions, comments? Yes. You had, a, you had somebody who started the program that was kind of RIP, retired in place. Yes. And they just, they're, they weren't looking for students, they weren't looking at the overall impact. They were just. They were looking at retirement, or it was a hobby shop, and, and they could put their stuff in there and do what they wanted to. It is what it was, an administration that had no clue about automotive or what was happening. A lot of high schools I saw that in, 
where um, they they just said, well, if the autom automotive instructor says so, it, it's got to be true, and I don't know any different, and there's nobody to ask because he's the expert or she's the expert, you know. And there there are some automotive and college teachers out there, some unsung heroes that, you know, whether they have support or not, they're they're beating their head against the wall and doing the best they can by their students. They care, they're passionate, uh, they, they just, they don't get the support in their community. Uh, if it wasn't for the lunch that we had together, this wouldn't have happened today. So, you know, having Jim, having Lucas, uh, where's he at? Is he still out there at the grill? Chad? Oh, there he is in the back. Can't help it. I got to go there. He's at the barbershop the other day and got a haircut. And was talking about bald guys and how he makes that nice shine. And he opened the cabinet. And what did he get out? A spray can of olive oil. He said, best thing to make a bald man shine. <laughs> I, I want to thank everybody that it helped us. If it wasn't for that lunch and these guys stepping up and not just offering, but uh, kind of pushing me a little bit, because I'm like, well, let me think, let me ask. No, nah, we're, come on, come on. And uh, I haven't been pushed in a while, so it was good. I'm tired, but this is the result of it. I haven't spoke to a person today that didn't say they didn't learn something. They didn't get something out of this training. And it's, what is it, almost 2 o'clock? And y'all are still here. You haven't run out the door. I've got ex-wives that have been gone by now. <laughs> um, <I> mean, <laughs> All right. Uh, if there's no other questions, thank you. Uh, do you want to go right into the student? All right. And uh, I'm going to let this man take over and ask students questions. I have certain students that I want to come up here because I'm going to put you on the spot. And I'm going to put Nico and I'm going to put my work study and I'll put Doug. You three come up here. You can sit on a stool. You can sit on the little one there. And the name is Miss Kakona, Mr. Kakona. <laughs> Best I can. All right, I'm going to turn it over to you, sir. Thank you, everyone. conversation 
about Edward Deming, continual improvement, and how I use that TDSA cycle to teach technicians how to fix faults. And that was the first time we met, and goodness, this is where I ended up. Um, when I found out I got falling cold, I asked Ms. Burris, Benji, yep. um, if he would come up and give me a hand. So I'd just like to say Jim had like at least six hours notice. I had maybe a 45 minutes to an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, gentlemen, this is about you guys. And so we want to hear from you about your experience with the program so far and your view of this path that you're on. Where you're headed, what you like. Why is Mitch Do you hear me? I really do. You can't fix a problem unless somebody explains it to you. Yes, sir. And you're allowed to have an opinion. That's good enough. Okay. So why don't you guys do this? We've introduced ourselves. Why don't you guys go down the line and introduce yourselves? Just a little background on how long you've been here. We've heard a little bit about you, sir. But a little bit about your background. And then I'm going to come through and just might throw a question at you. I'll let you go one, two, three, three, two, one. I don't care. And we'll go from there. Uh, I'm Douglas Triplett. I've been in the automotive field since June. Yeah, June, I work at Ovens Auto. And I've been going here since August. So. My name, uh, my name is Nico. I live up in Boone. I come down here three times a week. I started back in August doing the associate's degree. Um, I started in August. This is my first year out of the two. And I've always turned wrenches with my grandpa, but I wanted to come here and do what he wanted me to do. And that's why I chose. My name is Devin Peters. I've been in this program since May. And kind of what got me into it is I've always had a passion for working on vehicles. Okay. So I'm going to come right back to you real quick. Yes. You've always had a passion for working on vehicles. Yeah. I got to ask, where did that come from? Truthfully, Seriously. as a kid, I had a Tonka truck and like different little cars. And I just, I like to figure out how they work. This it just didn't. Yep. It just interested me. It caught my attention, so I just started tinkering with stuff like that. And then just people I was around. I grew up in a junkyard, so I kind of got used to being around junk cars and seeing how they were took apart and put back together. And then they uh, Antioch Speedway. I had they done some racing on Antioch Speedway, uh, which is a dirt track. Okay. And so I kind of grew up around race cars and stuff, and it just kind of intrigued me. Okay, so you had that that classic exposure that a lot of us had. I mean, there there are young folks your age, I know that they couldn't care less how a car works. So you had some exposure to it and that influence. Okay. Nico, you said something, I'm trying to pay attention to everything. You said something that said, granddad sounds like somebody important to you. Yeah. Okay. Um, you said you wanted to do what he wanted you to do. Explain. Can you explain that a little bit more? So when I was really little, I was, you know, I was always smart with taking stuff apart and putting it back together. We don't talk about the piston putting in backwards, though. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I was always smart as a kid doing it. And he introduced me in the motors. He introduced me in how everything works and what was his passion. And that was something that we really bonded over. And he always saw the goodness and the greatness in me and that he knew I could do better. I was never book smart. You know, I never, never got math all that much. Never got science, never got nothing like that. But mechanics and blue collar have always gotten my attention. I've always done good. In them. And when he, he passed away about two years ago now, and he just, I keep going for him. I keep going because this is my passion and it's something that I take pride in joining. Can, I don't know you, okay? I'm not your mentor. Can I challenge you on something? Yeah. 
I hear this a lot. I didn't like math. I didn't like science. I hate to read. And here's Nico in a field. It's all based on physics. He's going to have technical information in front of him the rest of his life, my friend. Okay? Don't discount it because I know from what I've heard, you're smart enough to get it all. Let me tell you something about math. It's logical. People aren't. Okay. <laughs> there, math is easier to figure out than people. And you start looking at things in the industry, like driver assist systems. Do you know why a lot of guys struggle with driver assist systems? It ain't just math. Placing the targets and understanding how it works is trigonometry. Okay? It ain't two plus two is four. It's trigonometry. And that's what we're doing these days. We're getting into some cool stuff. And trust me, you can get it just trying the right mentor. And this is where age starts to come in. Yeah. So you're working at a shop, mm -hmm. or, or work, still working at a shop. Yeah. Awesome. So you started at the shop before you started school. Yeah. Was this something that they... No, I was planning on taking it before I started at the shop. Okay. And started at the shop. And they support you doing that? Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. All right, you, you get the next question. <laughs> What do you see as the biggest challenge for you coming in new without the experience? What do you think is going to be your biggest challenge within the next year? Self-doubt. That is, that is something that I've always battled is self-doubt. You know, I've never really had confidence in myself. And I'm starting to, especially working with Lucas and Roy and all all the guys I work with, including Scott. <laughs> <laughs> he's already he's already got that uh, enter technician enter <laughs> down there, I see. Um, you know, it's it's even you know the the first thing that really gave me confidence is you know I think it was about a week of being in that shop. And Terry showed me how to do something I'd never done, and that was tie rods. And, yeah, I was a little scared at first, you know. Yeah. I, <laughs> you know, it was scary, but he he took the time, and he showed. And Eric has done the same thing, and George and Deckert and Jackals, even though he's not here. And Scott just sells parts. <laughs> 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 but, um, you know, they've – all of them have helped me build my confidence. And, and get rid of that self-doubt and that self-worry self that I've had. So I'm just going to take a guess and say you are your own worst enemy. Yeah. You are you're your biggest critic, yeah. correct? Yeah. So that is something that, that you will continue to work with and grow. Take the, take the screw-ups. Take them with a grain of salt, because I can tell you now, you're in a shop to where you you can make a mistake. They're not going to come down your throat. They're going to help you correct it. That will be one of the biggest confidence building things that you will ever be able to do. Yeah, is just learn from those mistakes and continue to build. It, it takes time. But you'll get it. My biggest challenge would be retaining knowledge. Honestly, like retaining information and stuff, it takes me a couple of times, like I'm more hands-on than book. Okay. So it takes me a few times of actually being able to hands-on do it before I fully grasp and understand what I'm doing, rather than just sitting down and reading it out of a book. We all have different learning styles. I, absolutely. Some people can read it and they got it. <laughs> Some people, they've got it, like you said, they got to be that hands-on. Um, that does not get any easier with age, and then you're going to hit that point where it gets a whole lot harder. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have to, I have to jump in just a little bit here. Benji and I know each other, and I respect the heck out of him. 
I'm a mechanic. I was a Nashville Auto Diesel graduate. I did take a fully academic curriculum in high school, all college prep, four years of foreign language and all that stuff. So when I went to Nashville, <laughs> honestly, there, there, there wasn't an academic challenge there. Um, it was more like me geeking out over the technical stuff. And I grew up on a farm. So that's where my love of it came from. I want to challenge your perspective on learning style. And I want to give you something. And I'm offering this to everybody because I hear this constantly. If somebody's got a pen, if not, I'll, I'll give it to them afterwards. I want you to look at um, Bloom's taxonomy. Mm -hmm. And I want you to look at um, learn, there's actual studies on brain science of learning retention, okay? And so, unfortunately, we do a lot of things through lecture and watching videos. And that's part of our learning process. And the fact of the matter is, we only tend to retain about 5% of that especially if there's no space to repetition, follow on, okay? If we start to come down that pyramid and the things get wider, we start to look at how much we retain from each of those types of interactions. And one of the best ones, and you just said it yourself, you work with somebody and you're shown it and you do it. The retention from that, when you were working on the tie rod ends, that hits around 50%, okay? Mm -hmm. The base of that pyramid and where you retain the most is teaching. So if you take something you learn and you're put in a position to have to give that to somebody else, you now have to think about it from all the ways you won't have to explain it to somebody else. So it's not that we learn hands-on, but hands-on combines see, do, show, tell. It combines more inputs than just the fact you had your hands on it. So anybody that does any teaching or mentoring, it seems like silly, but as you go forward, I can tell you, every one of you guys can develop into being a mentor. And to do that, you're gonna have to teach. And you'll be good at it. What's your biggest fear of what's coming? Well, they took both the big ones. Like mine, it was in elementary school. You have to learn it to the test, then you throw it out to the next big test. And it's just, you don't use it, I'll forget it. If I don't use it, I'll forget it. And repeating it and repeating it helps. Okay. I hope I'm not out of line here, but it, my challenge to you would be, what you're learning, don't learn it like the first four pages of that book. Think about what you're being taught that's new and try and relate it to something that's not new. Right. What if I told you I could take electrical theory and explain to you how an old Ford DPFE sensor works for EGR flow by using circuit theory to explain how that works? So I take one thing that I knew and relate it to something I don't know. And you know why that works? It's all physics and math. All right? And then the two are familiar. And now I'm not forgetting it. I'm building on it. Mm -hmm. That'll help you a lot. Okay? Thank you. My pleasure. Um, I understand you had an interesting conversation with somebody who's playing with a microphone. What was that topic about? Um, Sorry, I had a little bit of pre-game. Well, which one are we talking about here? Because I've had a few different discussions. Money, financials. Well, I, I asked... A bunch of it because somebody's going to want it. <laughs> oh. I, I, I've, I, I've had multiple talks with Lucas about, you know, shop management because it's the truth. That's something that I'm super interested in. And, uh, you know, I'm not expecting him to walk out of Caldwell or walk out with him five years later and expect to open up my own shop. I know it takes time. I want to gain the experience before I do it. 
and uh, and we've had and we've had talks about financial and how much you know how much is needed for start shop startup. And when he told me the price, my jaw just went. I mean, it, it just <laughs> dropped to the floor. You know, like and it's you know money is money is it's, it can be hard or it can be easy to make depending on how you make it, how you make it to be. There we go. That's the right word. And, um, you know, I'm still, I'm still learning how to do that. And that, that question really just kind of threw me off right there. I apologize. Uh, no, 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 no. You're good. And, um, at least you're, how old are you? I'm 19. At least you're thinking about it. And so I wish somebody would have had a good conversation with me when I was 19. Honestly, I could have taken the easy path and been in air traffic control like my dad. I wouldn't be here. I'd be retired. <laughs> Honest answer. I wouldn't be having here as much fun. <laughs> um, but I will say, though, uh, today's, um, what's the word that I'm looking, seminar or the, with uh, Mr. White. I know you don't like to be called Mr., I'd still call him Mr. But you know, he he made a lot of sense today. I didn't have much questions for him after. And uh, Lucas is a great mentor too. He's you know he's showing me what I need to start doing, how I need to start planning, especially if I want to get out of here in five ten years, if that's possible, and start my own business. So. I could not imagine being nineteen years old and already looking at the future of opening my own business. That is absolutely amazing. So you take what you've learned today and what you will learn in the future, continue to be that sponge. I applaud you for that. That's that's phenomenal. Most, uh, most 19, I, let's see, I got a 21 and a 23 and a 17 year old at home. I don't know that they're thinking about that. So that's that's awesome. That's awesome. But, but by the same token, it's not the same path for everybody. Some people will go look up on the internet when cer certain people made it. You know, the colonel from Kentucky Fried Chicken or uh, Dave from Wendy's and all these people. It was like they were older than Lucas, right? <laughs> Well, which, which, which isn't that hard to do. Well, I'm, I'm anniversaries of 25, so you can just go away. <laughs> um, <laughs> so here, all right, here's the question. You guys have heard a little bit from these folks. How much biggest questions do we have? Y'all got any questions for us? Or? There you took charge, see that? Where do you see yourself in five years? Hopefully. <laughs> Who just said that? <laughs> wow. Have you ever thought of it? Yeah. It's just like... <laughs> 17. You got plenty of time. See, and, this is the, and this is the issue, depending on who it is. Five years, that's darn near 30 year life. <laughs> right? He isn't thinking that way yet. But he will. He will. You got time, just don't don't waste it. I heard a I heard a I heard a gentleman say, Do you live on someday I'll? Someday I'll get a job making five thousand a month. Not enough anymore. Someday I'll get a new house. Someday I'll have this car I want. And I'll some and someday I'll never come. And so the advice, and I'll tell you who it is, was Zig Ziglar. He said, he said, if you do what you've got to do every day as if you were leaving for Acapulco tomorrow on a trip, it's going to be awesome. If you live every day that way, pretty soon you'll be headed to Acapulco. So just see where it takes you. Have fun with it. Who else? You, do you want to get that from everybody? That'd be good. He's got a plan. He, he, he hopes to be. Well, a... well, I will say the one thing that I've not really planned out is what exactly I want to do. 
you know, when I open up my own shop is do I want to specialize in kind of what Lucas does with performance or do I want to do, you know, custom or do I want to do like that? That's one thing that I'm still, yeah. And so, so that's what I'm trying to still figure out. And uh, it, it's tricky, you know, cause I like a million different things, but you know, I also want to think financially what one's better to go at. Truthfully, I kind of thought about the same thing as Nico has, but I would like experience in a shop first. I'd like to work somewhere for five to ten years, and I'm doing a two-year program or associate's degree here at CCC and TI. So that's taken off two years of that already, so that leaves three years. So give or take, in five to ten years, I'm hoping to try to open up or work somewhere, gain the experience and knowledge, and possibly pursue to open up my own business. So. Have any of you folks outside to go into a business and go in with an agreement to work to take it over to be to be the succession plan? Um, See, I'm, I haven't honestly because I have like most people that own shops. Like whenever if something happens to them, they pass away or something, it goes on to the next person. Or when they retire, it goes on to like the next person and their generation and stuff. So I haven't really thought about that. I've always I had two uncles. We had a shop in Chicago yeah. on 79th and Cicero. And they were successful. And when they retired, they had three brothers that worked for them. And they had a plan in place. And they transitioned that shop to those three brothers, who, to my knowledge, are still running it now, but they're about retirement age. So it happens. Unfortunately, in our industry, and I think we've all seen this, there's been a lot of us that have children that have said, don't you come into this. You stay away from this. So don't always think that that shop owner who's getting on up and looking at possibly retiring. Yeah. They may not have that plan set up. Yeah, there's a lot of them that don't. There is no exit strategy. The exit strategy is whenever they get towed out of that bay dead. Um, I have to go with him. You know, I've never really thought about it. Just kind of like the same way. I didn't, you know, it's usually passed. I thought it was passed down generation by generation. But, you know, y'all y'all just pretty much clear up my answer on that one. So. I've thought about it. But then the same thing as them. I always thought it just passed down, passed down. And they got another option to explore. Other question? I had a question. Because I had two of y'all shops. Mm -hmm. So um, it is part time. I work ten hours a week. It basically just helping with the shop and stuff. So, so the question I have is, um, at this moment, at your age, what does a perfect shop look like? Uh, Honestly, just a reliable, trustworthy somebody you can come to and know that, hey, I'm bringing my car to you. It's going to be fixed. It's going to be repaired the proper way. Not somebody who's just going to come in and do what they can to fix it and send you on your merry way. So I, I would <coughs> prefer to run a business and know, hey, this is how things are ran because this is how I, you know, put things down and tell my employees to run it. And it, no, it's not just the like, hey, I'm in charge. It's just having that thought process and knowing because if you lead by example, then people will follow your example. Yeah, because it feels like what, a company like uh, Hayes, In between both, between trucks and vehicle, like cars, it don't matter really brand, just whatever. Um, so I, I put into some thought about, you know, if, uh, you know, whatever I decide to land on whenever the time comes for opening up a shop, um, I've thought about, and I've had conversations with Lucas about this too. Uh, I've thought about a lot of custom work. You know, I came, I, I moved here from Myrtle Beach about two, three years ago now. And so I come from a huge, like huge community, not just cars, but bikes and trucks and all that. And, you know, that was something, that was another thing that me and my grandpa were very passionate into was uh, customization to his bike or to the 85 that we had sitting at the house. And, uh, you know, my truck itself, you know, I've customized that thing out the wazoo just because it's something I like doing. And I know that there's kids younger than me and some guys that are older than me that don't know how to do that kind of stuff. And I would love to do that. I mean, I would still love to do, you know, repairs and everything like that. But 
focus on what I love doing too. Um, for employees, you know, I want trustworthy, honest, hardworking. That's not going to slack off. And, you know, in a shop environment, from what I can tell, uh, there is, you know, you can cut up and you can have fun, but there's also a time to get serious and do your work. And, you know, I would love to do also, uh, like he was talking about teaching and mentoring, you know, I would love to be a mentor one day and share the knowledge that I gain out of all this to somebody that needs it. And so I would love to set up an apprenticeship program like Lucas is doing. And, you know, I don't know how many of y'all that are shop owners have an apprenticeship program, but like y'all do too. So I've thought about it. I know too many people that went to a shop, trusted someone, and they just full on throw them out the door, give me as much money as you as I want, and you're you're not getting a car back. So if I get a, if I do a shop, I want it to be trustworthy and like people come back and back, tell the fans and everything. Um doesn't matter what kind of car, just and I want employees and everything, I want to be like a big family. Like I most places you go like, oh we're a big family and then you go and then people stab you in the back. That's not what anyone looks forward to. So Any more? No one. Um, I got a question for you. We've been talking about uh, shop owners and uh, what you can do for that and what you want. Let's talk about, so, and the question I have is what is uh, something as an apprentice that you want out of the mix? What's one thing that you would really like out of the mix when entering a shop? So, one thing that I would want out of a mentor is patience you know I'm not, <laughs> that, that's the honest truth is patience you know because i like when i first when i first came to codwell you know i thought to myself oh i knew everything you know I, i'm gonna i'm gonna ace this i'm gonna do great first day i stepped into roy's class i was like boy i don't know nothing <laughs> and um you know all the guys from l and n you know they're very patient with me they'll they'll show me they'll break it down they'll explain it um so patience is one and just, I mean, really that's, that's all I would ask for is patience. So, so why are you asking that? I got you. So, okay, in your in your business, right? Would you would so? My question to you, as is in your business as an owner, would you be the um, perfect mentor? No, of course not. Of course not. And, and and the reason being is is because as a business owner, we have so many things coming at us in so many different directions. That we can't necessarily see clearly. Yeah. Okay. And so I have financial pressures coming at me. I have client pressures coming at me. I have all of these different things that are constantly coming my way. And it will skew my judgment. It will skew my perspective. It will skew what I think is best for you because of the scenario I have. And so for you, it's best to have Noah being your mentor. It's best to have Eric being your mentor. It's best to have Terry being your mentor because they are focused on one thing at hand right now. And they can engage that. They can dig into that. And they can teach to that. Right? Yeah. Whereas my focus is I'm trying to serve 32 clients at once. Yeah. I'm trying to serve 16 employees at once. I'm trying to serve everyone. And so the problem is, is the slice of pie that I can provide you is very small compared to the slice of pie they can provide. I got you. Sorry, I didn't mean to pick you up on this. <laughs> but I knew some of the narrative from it. So y'all basically hit on a lot of the areas earlier, that sink or, uh, sink or float situation to where they just throw you out there and say, hey, here's an assignment, do it. If I don't know how to do it, then I need somebody to show me. Or if it's not it's not something I'm familiar with being a new technician or something, so I may ask you a couple questions and if you just figure it out yourself. But if I'm experienced and that's different, I should know how to do that. But if it's a new situation to where I'm freshly out of college and I'm just kind of throwing out a task to do, 
I'm going to interrupt because yeah. I think one of the most powerful things yes, sir. that I've ever heard an instructor, and he, he talks about this sometimes, there's an instructor sitting right here, and he says, when they ask me how to do something, I say, very quickly. Yeah. Right? And so you're going to have to learn that. Yeah. You're going to have to engage that. You're going to have to give it a try. Oh, yeah. And we're going to have to coach you through it. And I think, Jim, you will agree, we've not necessarily done a very good job of that. We've not done a good job of coaching through. And, and so, I'm sorry, I'm going to throw you right under the bus. Beep, beep, beep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm going over you first, and then I'm going to back Then you're back. Okay. Uh, I, I saw how big your eyebrows were. And he said, they'll turn around and slap you in the face. Why did your eyebrows get that big? So I'll, I'll tell you what I was hearing, like when you were talking, and, and actually a common theme here, what I heard from every one of them is they want to work someplace where they can be proud of what they're doing. They want to know they're doing a good job, they're taking care of their clients, and they're in a shop environment, I'm paraphrasing, yeah. but you're in a shop environment that supports you doing that successfully, right? And boy, coming in, the new broom sweeps clean and they'll make all these promises in the world. And then the first time that you need a hand with something. And yeah, I've seen that happen too much. So that was what that's what I was reacting to. I was hearing. And I don't like doing all this younger, older generational stuff, but I hear that type of concern from a lot of younger folks. And why do they have that concern? Probably because they've seen the other side of it too dang much, right? Where people are only in it for the short term, the instant gratification, and they're not trying to, well, they're not trying to do the wise, right? Rick used the word client a lot. I used, I've used the word client instead of customer or consumer for years. Because if you look up client, client is like what an attorney has. Mm -hmm. They have a fiduciary responsibility, which means monetary responsibility to look out for that client's best interest. Imagine that being the why of a shop. It's my responsibility to look out for your best interest with what we're doing with your car. Now, you're going to pay me well for that, just like you're going to pay a lawyer well for looking out for you. Doesn't mean you're doing a charity job here. But when you think of people as a client, somebody you're looking out for, it changes the kind of work you do. So, uh -oh. so we've, got, we've got a comment on YouTube. Uh-oh. You know a man by the name of Eric O? The South Main Auto? You ever heard of that? Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, and he just said probably one of the biggest YouTube channels out there in the automotive space, and he says, I will not let my kids pursue this industry. <laughs> this is a young guy, right? This is a young guy right now. And the fact that he picked up on it, that, what did he say? He said, I keep hearing about these shops, and they say you're a family, and they come in, you, you go into it, and they stab you with that in the back. <laughs> But who kept saying that shouldn't be the industry? Those are bad players. Mm -hmm. And I think what we all have to remember, especially newer people getting into this, what we all have to remember is how many people go on and write a good review versus how many people write a bad review, right? It's really, here's the phrase. It is much easier to criticize than it is to create. So as, a, as a, a curriculum developer, I can spend time and thought and put all this, this effort in building a curriculum. And somebody can come along and go, oh, like, well, you said that. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> you know, let's put yours out and let's critique that. Right? Because it's really easy to criticize. And so we have to remember that some of this that they hear Somebody was telling me earlier that the controversial topics get the views. Look at the news. If it bleeds, it leads, 
right? So if you want views and you want attention, you go in and you put the article out about the shop that was spraying, like this is as old as I am, spraying oil on shock absorbers and selling it, right? And doing a timing belt with a, 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 a bottle of engine cleaner. It's all new, look, see, right? And underneath the parts are in the toolbox. And so that stuff makes the news, but not the shops that are out here grinding and taking good care of their clientele. And getting paid really well for it. And getting paid really well for it. Who said that? Yes. The coach. The coach. <laughs> what else? You guys got any other questions? So, Grant, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I think you're spot on. There was a there was a shop owner who's retired from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, mm -hmm. and he made the decision to go into automotive repair. And he he put it this way: I'm going to be in the in the job of fixing and maintaining whatever the majority of the population is using for personal transportation. So who was the first, who was the first people in personal transportation going way back? Henry try, Ford. try and tell you a story. Who? Henry Ford. Oh no, you gotta go farther back than that. Oh, far oh yeah, oh yeah. Absolutely. Horses. Horses. But back. Oh. <laughs> a cobbler. Yeah. Guy making did. you shoes. Yeah, okay. Right? And everybody needed a pair of shoes. Everybody walked and everybody wore them out. And he had a steady stream of, of work. And then the horses come along. Right? And we figured out that if we put steel bands on their feet, they go farther and they last longer. Right? And now we figured out how to make a wagon wheel. And the, and the, and the guys would make those out of wood. And now we had a cart. And so we could take one horse and one cart and haul four people and they wouldn't wear out their shoes as fast. Did that start to affect the cobbler's business? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Right? So you keep going and then we figure out, hey, wagon wheels break up. And then the blacksmith who used to do all kinds of horseshoes and they started using carts. Now it doesn't take as many horses to haul people around because we can pull a cart. But I can make metal bands for the wheels so they don't break up in the ruddy roads. And they, they adapted their business. As transportation changed, they adapted their business to continue to work. If you look at what's happened in our business, oh, 134, psh, I just don't work on air conditioning anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, distributorless ignition, now, if it doesn't have points of condenser, I don't work on it no more. Fuel injection, yeah. fuel injection, it ain't gonna last. That's terrible stuff. I don't know, I'm not gonna work, learn to work on that stuff. So what, what, what Grant was saying, he said, it doesn't matter what it is, if it's flying saucers in the future, we'll figure out how to work on it. If it's hoverboards, I don't care what it is, but if you're in the business of taking care of the way people move around, maybe you'll be beaming their atoms across the country someday, I don't know. I won't be here, but learn to be in that business and you will always have business. Any other questions? We, you guys think the future looks brighter than you might have thought? Got anything else? Yes, sir. Andy? Good to go. Guys, I want to thank y'all for coming out today. Thank, awesome. thank y'all. It was, it was awesome. <laughs> Oh,
It's my pleasure to be Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you as well. Roy, sir. Are we going? Oh, yeah. Time to uh, give away this here standard air stuff. I got the tickets right here. All right. Now, here, here's the thing about this. Who, who in here knows Paul Danner? Who in here's met Paul? Paul Danner is probably one of the kindest, best human beings you'll ever meet. He's done more for our industry than so many that you could ever imagine. And, and I was telling the story about him the other day. You know, when you met me, you were talking about one of the first times I came down here and I gave you some yes. books. And you were talking about I was a hot mess of a human being, right? I, I, when I first met him, he brought me books from an old dealer. And because he said the other day, he said, the first time we met and I brought those books. And I had to go home and think that was him. Because when I first met Mo, he was worse than a hot mess. Yeah, I had a cut off t shirt. And... I thought that's the most country, redneck, no nothing, low life. Well, that ain't changed much. <laughs> nah, but I wasn't done. <laughs> And, and, and then I thought, he went from that to this. Well, so and not this, but his business. You know? So shortly shortly after what Roy's talking about, I, I made a decision. I, I, I went home. I was running a shop. I had no business running a shop. had no clue what I was doing, right? And I went home. And George, George was working for me at the time. But I went home, and I told my wife, I said, I'm not doing this anymore. This is tough. This is hard. And, and she supported that idea. She supported me going to work for somebody else. And I had made the decision, I'm going to start doing all the technical training I can so I can go get a job somewhere. And that technical training started with Scanner Danner. It started with me sitting in the floor with my two-year-old little daughter watching Scanner Danner videos. And the way that he talked, the way that he provided the information was like nothing I'd ever seen before. And it was like he was speaking to my technical mind. I could understand it. I could take it. And because of that, I gained a hunger for knowledge that I had never had before. I realized that because I was hungry for it, because I needed it, it was, it was an emergency situation that I gained this knowledge or I wasn't going to survive, that I had found a hunger for knowledge that would drive me to other places. And so that's where I met Rick. It sent me to ASTE and Rick changed my life. And, and all of these things came together to create where we're standing today. It created a 10 base shop in Blowing Rock I never thought I'd have. And so it all started with Paul Danner, right? It started with these books right here. Some of the best technical training in the world, in my opinion. And so a few months back, Paul sent me these books. And he said, you've always been a supporter of mine. You do with them what you think. And so I think it's time that we honor Paul's wishes and we give these away to honor the next generation, to help them learn from his hard work and his efforts. Now, not only is this book a very thorough book, it takes you all the way through the diagnostic process. It takes you through the basics, reading electrical diagrams, the whole nine yards. But he also has what's called Scanner Danner Premium. And Scanner Danner Premium is such a special product because it has every single college course that he taught every case study, every bit of information you could ever want. If you want to know how to fix something and you don't understand how it works, he teaches you in this class. So we're going to give away two of these. Roy's got a cup. We're just doing this for the students. Roy, let's pick some students out here. All right. I got no clue what number is what. You need your glasses? One. Well, no, I'm going to let you read it because I forgot my glasses back here and I can't see the numbers. <laughs> All right. The first one. Four five four seven five nine. Four five four seven five nine. Mr. Pope. All right, sir. Here's your book. Thank you. Absolutely. We're going to get you in contact with Paul. We're going to set you up. I'm going to send an email. I need you to give all your information to Roy. I need you to name your email address. All of that stuff. And we'll make sure that we get you Scanner Danner Premium. I only have one ask of you. Use it. Please use it. Okay? All right. Pick a card, any card. All right, let's do that one right there. All right. 454761. Oh, my goodness. 
Okay. Okay. You want it? All right, brother. Same message to you. All I ask is that you use it, okay? I want you I want you to get into the channel. I want you to pay attention to it. I want you to watch the videos. It will change your life, okay? All right. Thank you, buddy. Absolutely. Mine too, buddy. Absolutely. Guys, just want to say thank you so much for being here. I know a lot of you came because we asked you to come. This is this important to me that I'd ask many of you to come from states away and all over the place. It means more than you could ever imagine all of you are here. If you want to talk about changing your industry, this right here is where it starts. This is how you'll change it by showing up to stuff like this. I'm tired of the excuses. I'm tired of the BS where we talk about the industry is terrible and it doesn't work and it doesn't work for me and it doesn't work the way I think it should. If you don't like it, step up and do something to change it because it will never change until you take action. It is our responsibility. You can't wait on somebody else to do it. It's our turn to do it. Without further ado, Roy, I'll let you take it away. I don't have much more to say beyond that. We've been talking all day and there's not much left to say. Thank you. And I can't say thank you enough to the students for the choices they've made for being here today, spending their Saturday, for the mechanics, for the shop owners, for the wives that are sitting around here that have sit there all day long, for the children that were in the back, not just the baby. We had a row of them back here earlier, but uh, it's been a... No, Eric's my boy. He's my child. He's a love child. What's the lack of love child, whatever you're going to call it. <laughs> but to, to the trainers that came in today, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, the valuable information that you shared. It's, uh, the people that I've spoke to, and I've spoke to a lot today and last night, uh, it, they're just so amazed at the things that you guys shared and what they've got that they can take home and apply. And I'm glad that my students could see a positive outlook on the industry and see what there is out there beyond just what's in their neighborhood. Thank you, and I'm, and I'm done. Good night, go home, find a good Korean love comedy, chill with Netflix, Hallmark Channel. Thank you.